The 8,600th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for the meeting is maintenance of international peace and security, challenges to peace and security in the Middle East. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Bahrain, Egypt, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Iraq, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the Syrian Arab Republic, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates to participate in the meeting. It is so decided. I propose that the Council invite the permanent observer of the Observer State of Palestine to the United Nations to participate in the meeting in accordance with the provisional rules of procedure and the previous practice in this regard. There being no objection, it is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms. Maria Luisa Ribeiro Fiotti, Chief of the Cabinet of Secretary General, to participate in the meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I also invite the following to participate in this meeting. His Excellency, Mr. Silvio Gonzato, Chargé d'Affaires ad Interim of the Delegation of the European Union to the United Nations, and His Excellency, Mr. Magat Abdelaziz, Permanent Observer for the League of Arab States to the United Nations. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to draw the attention of the Council members to document S-2018-643, a letter dated 6 of August 2018 from the Permanent Representative of Poland to the United Nations addressed to the Secretary General transmitting a concept paper on the item under consideration. Now I give the floor to Ms. Maria Luisa Ribeiro Viotti. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister Jacek Czaputowicz, Secretary of State Michael Pompeo, State Secretary Andreas Michaelis, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the Polish Presidency for convening this timely discussion. The situation in the Middle East remains troubling and complex, characterized by protracted conflicts, geopolitical tensions that play out at the regional level, governance issues, as well as severe deficits in socioeconomic development in a number of countries. Yet, as the Secretary General noted to this Council last year, and I quote, the mechanisms and the safeguards to manage the risks of escalation that existed in the past no longer seem to be present. Our shared aspiration must be to find ways for a region so rich in human capital and natural resources to fully realize its potential for the benefit of all. We must never lose sight of this. In recent weeks alone, we have seen some of the challenges on full display. The series of incidents in the Strait of Hormuz and adjacent waterways have raised tensions to dangerous levels. It is crucial that the rights and duties related to navigation are respected in accordance with international law. Restraint and genuine dialogue are urgently needed in order to avoid the risk that a minor miscalculation would inadvertently lead to a major confrontation with disastrous consequences even well beyond the region. Deep disagreements about Iran's nuclear program are further exacerbating differences in the Gulf. Notwithstanding the concerns about it, 
the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action remains the only agreed international framework to address Iran's nuclear program. In Syria, Special Envoy Guy Pedersen is sparing no effort to finalize the arrangements for the launch of the Constitutional Committee as a door opener to a broader UN-facilitated political process in line with Resolution 2254 and to implement confidence-building measures, including on detainees. However, the United Nations is concerned that the ongoing hostilities in northwest Syria may risk undermining the Special Envoy's efforts to revive the political process. In Yemen, the United Nations continues to provide desperately needed life-saving humanitarian assistance, while Special Envoy Martin Griffith remains engaged in efforts to implement the Hodeida Agreement. We hope that this will lead to broader and full inclusive discussions on ending the conflict. And the Israeli-Palestinian conflict remains the longest standing issue on the UN peace and security agenda. A just solution acceptable to both sides is essential for the future of the whole region. The United Nations remains ready to support efforts towards allowing Palestinians and Israelis to live in two democratic states side by side in peace and within secure borders and recognized borders based on relevant United Nations resolutions. As in other regions, realizing the promise of full respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, and international humanitarian law requires commitment and bold action, especially within a view, with a view to ending conflict, addressing the root causes of violence, and sustaining peace. In the same vein, tackling the threat of terrorism and violent extremism must simultaneously address security concerns and uphold international human rights obligations. Accordingly, accelerating the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is intrinsically linked to conflict resolution and prevention. Inclusive growth, environmental sustainability, gender equality, and opportunities for young people are all key aspects of durable solutions. There have been some notable gains in gender equality in recent years, including substantial increase in literacy and education and access to health services. Yet, equal opportunities remain limited and gender-based violence is still widespread. Greater participation of women in governance and economic activities would not only improve family income and national economies, but also reduce vulnerabilities to socioeconomic shocks and liberate enormous potential. While equality before the law is gradually gaining ground, there is still a long way to go in a number of situations in amending discriminatory laws and ensuring more representative participation in parliaments and leadership in political and public life more generally. In conflict-affected countries, we know how crucial it is that women are able to play a meaningful role in peace processes. Indeed, women's equal participation is directly correlated with more sustainable peace. Yet, women continue to be marginalized. Moreover, with a pushback on women's and girls' rights at the core of terrorist and extremist agendas, it is all the more important that efforts to strengthen gender equality are central to our work in prevention, resilience, and peace. The power of youth is equally critical as recognized by the Security Council in its landmark resolution on youth, peace, and security. Children and young people make up nearly half the region's population. Job creation is an imperative and as in, in investing in education, training, and skills that match the need of today's societies and markets. The list of challenges is long, but that should not deter us. The first order of business must be preventing the most acute flashpoints in the region from boiling over. Keeping the channels of communications open needs to be priority number one, followed by confidence-building measures to move parties away from confrontation towards dialogue. The United Nations is addressing the numerous challenges on multiple fronts, from supporting preventive diplomacy 
to mediating the ongoing conflict, from providing humanitarian assistance to millions of people to addressing the human rights dimension, and from supporting sustainable development initiatives to nurturing capacities to tackle climate change, including through the region's ample alternative sources of energy. The special envoys and special representatives of the Secretary General in the region are working extensively with a wide range of regional and sub-regional organizations and national and regional stakeholders, including civil society and women's and youth groups, in close cooperation with the United Nations country teams. The role of the Security Council in maintenance in the maintenance of international peace and security remains indispensable. The Middle East region has many fault lines and divisions, yet within these challenges lies the opportunity to build on the words and intentions of the United Nations Charter towards action that will bring real change and a bright future to the peoples of the region. The United Nations remains strongly committed to that endeavor. I thank you. I thank Ms. Ribeiro Viotti for her briefing. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland. First, let me thank very warmly Maria Luisa Viotti for her insightful and comprehensive briefing on the recent developments in the Middle East and their impact on international peace and security. Let me also state that Poland fully subscribes to the UN statement to be delivered today. Middle Eastern issues have been discussed in this chamber very frequently. Unfortunately, solutions worked out so far did not provide peace and stability. In recent years, the region has been ravaged by the, a wave of violent conflicts in a number of its once peaceful countries. What we need is a positive approach to restore peace and economic growth in the, in the Middle East. Uneven distribution on wealth generates inequality, disrupts social cohesion, and distorts the economies. Therefore, promoting entrepreneurship, especially among young people, strengthening good governance, combating corruption, and ensuring access to education are key to, addre key to address social issues and release economic potential of the region. Ladies and gentlemen, our today's meeting comes at a critical time. Current uncertainties about the dynamics in the Middle East again keep the whole region in the political spotlight. In Syria, the war has not ended and any subsequent escalation may bring shattering consequences for the Syrian people. In Yemen, we witness the world's largest humanitarian crisis with 13 million people facing starvation. In the peace process between Israel and Palestine, the political solution acceptable for both sides remain elusive. In the Persian Gulf, growing tensions may develop by a minor accident or miscalculation into a military confrontation. There is a variety of root causes of these tensions, demographic pressure, weakness in economy and governance, accompanied by violent extremism, radicalization, and illegal mass migration. People in Syria, Yemen, and Palestine face a daily struggle with deprivation, food shortages, low quality medical care, and lack of education. It is our common responsibility and moral obligation to find the way to end the suffering of civilians and bring back peace and stability to the region. Security Council should actively support and initiate actions of those willing to act in accordance with international law to counter aggressive policies and activities in this region. Ladies and gentlemen, the security in the Middle East is integrally linked to the structure of world order. Conflicts and tensions in this region trigger 
worldwide pot political, economic and social consequences with the refugees and increased migration being one of the most urgent to address. Further challenges include international terrorism. The defeat of ISIL in Iraq and Syria is an important step, but we are still far from eliminating the scourge of terrorists in the region and the threat that it poses around the world. The aim for us is to set up rules and regulations of the financial system in such a way as to prevent the terrorists from using the existing gaps to conduct their activities. The return of foreign fighters also poses a threat to their homelands. Another challenge is pro proliferation of missiles capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction, particularly to non-state actors. The tragic consequences of the loopholes in the control system have been repeatedly observed, among others, in case of Houthi attacks in Yemen. It should be reiterated that the Security Council Resolution 1540 states that all countries should introduce domestic controls on technologies related to weapons of mass destruction and their delivery systems. We are also concerned as the member of the European Union that it is, that is a party to the JCPOA with Iran's announcement that it will not commit itself to fully abide by the provisions of the agreement. Iran should refrain from actions that could undermine further implementation of both the JCPOA and the Security Council Resolution 2231. An ongoing concern is freedom and security of maritime navigation in the region. The recent incidents of attacks and seizures of ships in the Gulf pose a direct threat to security of maritime navigation. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea must be fully observed. With its ample resources and strategic location, the Middle East plays a key role in securing global energy supplies. There is a need to strengthen the security of critical energy infrastructure in order to minimize the crude oil price fluctuations and enhance security of supply. Another key challenge is ensuring security in cyberspace. Responsible state behavior in cyberspace by nations in the Middle East can reinforce regional cyber stability. Excellencies, in the United Nations, it is often reiterated that there is a strong link between human rights and peace and security. In the Middle East, the observance of fundamental human rights such as free and fair elections, freedom of speech and rule of law is of particular importance. It applies also to the rights of women who are predestined to fight hatred and build stability and social peace. Last week, Poland organized a Security Council briefing on the international humanitarian law on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions. It is our common responsibility to observe the international law and protect the most vulnerable groups in armed conflicts, including children, women, people with disabilities, and members of religious minorities. In two days, on 22nd of August, we will celebrate also here in New York the International Day commemorating the victims of acts of violence based on religion or belief. Established by the UN General Assembly on the initiative of Poland, advancing the security and safety of religious minorities in the Middle East is our common obligation. The rich culture of the Middle East region also requires protection. We should safeguard tangible and intangible heritage. 
which helps develop interreligious and intercultural dialogue as a vital platform for reconciliation. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a bold initiative to deal with the challenges to peace and security in the region. Poland, in line with the EU position, underscores that solutions to the Middle East problems require multilateral approaches. Building up on these assumptions, we organized in February, jointly with the United States, the ministerial which gave a start to the Warsaw process. It will consist of working groups dealing with main horizontal topics that I have just presented. The groups will cover counterterrorism and illicit finance, missile proliferation, maritime and aviation security, cyber security, energy security, as well as humanitarian and human rights issues. We plan that the working groups will convene in October and November, and the results of their discussions will be presented at the high-level conference in the first month of 2020. We will be encouraging countries from around the globe to join these efforts. We trust that the Warsaw process will contribute to resolution of uh, multifaceted problems of the Middle East and bring more stability and confidence to the region and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to create conditions for stability and well-being in the region. Only then will the Middle East be able to unlock its enormous potential as valuable contributor to global peace and security. I thank you. Now I resume my function as President of the Council. I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Michael Pompeo, Secretary of State of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Vadi, for your briefings. Uh, I also want to thank our Polish friends for using this uh, Council Presidency to confront the complex challenges in the Middle East. Uh, as I argued in January of this year in Cairo, uh, the Trump administration is reviving America's leadership role in the region by building and supporting coalitions to tackle regional challenges. These aren't talk fests. We care about outcomes, not gestures. And we should consider what's been accomplished in just seven months. We helped dismantle ISIS's physical caliphate, and we continue to work with 79 partners in the Defeat ISIS coalition to help the region recover from that menace. We're working closely with the UN Special Envoy, Martin Griffiths, to help bring peace to Yemen. We're facilitating new links between Israel and her Arab neighbors through the Warsaw Ministerial and follow-on meetings <clears throat> that the President just discussed. We organized the Bahrain Workshop in June to bring together government, private sector, and civilian leaders to help improve the lives of the Palestinians. <clears throat> we hosted the second ever ministerial to advance religious freedom last month. Protecting religious minorities in the Middle East was the centerpiece of that event. And most recently, the United States launched our effort to protect international shipping in the Strait of Hormuz. We welcomed the United Kingdom and Bahrain as partners and look forward to other nations joining this mission to protect freedom of the seas. These are precisely the kinds of multilateral efforts the United States supports. They're meaningful, they're effective, and they reflect the values of freedom-loving societies which this Council should be working to uphold. But now's our opportunity to do more. Just look at the challenges facing the region. Conflict in Libya still rages. More than 5.5 million Syrian refugees and nearly 6 million internally displaced Syrians have yet to return to their homes because of continuing violence. The GCC rift has not fully healed. Many countries fail to honor their people's basic human rights. And radical Islamist terrorists and their financial benefactors are looking for new weaknesses to exploit. And of course, the Islamic Republic of Iran and its proxies continue to foment terror and unrest in Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen, with devastating humanitarian consequences. Since the United States declared our intention to bring all Iranian oil purchases to zero in April, the Ayatollah has gone all in on a campaign of extortion diplomacy. Here's just a short list of what the regime has done 
since July. On July 1st, Iran surpassed its 300 kilogram limit on its low enriched uranium stockpile in defiance of its nuclear commitments. On July 2nd, the Iran backed Houthis attacked Abha Airport in Saudi Arabia, and they've continued to do so since that time. On July 8th, Iran reached levels of enrichment of about 4.5%, breaching its nuclear commitments, which cap enrichment at 3.67%. Iran continues to threaten further expansions of its nuclear program in defiance of its international commitments. On July 10th, the IRGC Navy unsuccessfully attempted to seize a UK tanker as it passed through the Strait of Hormuz. On July 14th, the IRGC Navy seized a Panamanian flagged UAE owned tanker in the Strait of Hormuz. On July 19th, the IRGC Navy seized a British tanker, the Stan Ampero, in the Strait of Hormuz, and Iran continues to detain that ship and its crew. On July 19th, the IRGC Navy also seized the Liberian flagged British owned tanker, Mezdar. On July 25th, Iran test-fired a ballistic missile in defiance of UN Security Council Resolution 2231. And on another Iran-related note, we are already tracking very closely the JCPO provisions expiring in October of 2020, namely the UN arms embargo and the travel restrictions on Qasem Soleimani. The whole world is able to track them too. We now have a countdown clock on the State Department's Iran webpage. Time is drawing short to continue this activity of restricting Iran's capacity to foment its terror regime. The international community will have plenty of time to see how long it has until Iran is unshackled to create new turmoil and figure out what it must do to prevent this from happening. Clearly, from Aleppo to Aden, from Tri Tripoli to Tehran, greater, greater cooperation in the Middle East is needed more than ever. We need fresh thinking to solve old problems. That's why Poland and the United States have created the Warsaw Process and its working groups, which were recently announced. The Warsaw Process is the product of this year's Warsaw Ministerial to promote a future of peace and security in the Middle East. The creation of the working groups is another iteration of the United States mission to take on Middle East challenges with our friends, allies, and partners. The seven new working groups will focus on cybersecurity, human rights, maritime and aviation security, energy security, missile proliferation, counterterrorism, and humanitarian issues and refugees. We call for all nations which have been invited to attend the initial meetings of the first five of those groups this fall. And we express our gratitude to Bahrain, Romania, and South Korea for joining Poland and the United States in hosting them. No one country will be the subject of these discussions. All nations will be heard and all voices will be respected. And we continue to work through the Warsaw process. As we continue to work through the Warsaw process, we will look to reconvene nations in 2020 for a follow-up to the Warsaw Ministerial. I hope that you all will be there. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency Mr. Pompero for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Andreas Michaelis, State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office in, of Germany. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Excellencies, uh, Germany welcomes the initiative taken by Poland uh, to put today's meeting on the agenda, and we uh, particularly uh, appreciate U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's presence among us today. The Middle East has always been looked at as a volatile region, and one of the truisms was and is that it can be destabilized easily. Unfortunately, this is what we witness today. But this is not the old story. Many trends indicate that we are looking at a new Middle East. And this new Middle East certainly does not match the vision of a prosperous and peaceful region which spread in the 1990s. It is the story of increased tensions and mounting dangers. Allow me to distinguish five trends. Firstly, we see heightened tensions between states of the region. This, for instance, holds true of the situation along the Gulf. Secondly, we observe long-term internal conflicts which contribute to large-scale fragmentation, Syria and Yemen being two examples. Thirdly, we are looking at an interplay of intra- and interstate conflict. 
This is what characterizes the nature of the conflicts in Syria and Yemen. They increasingly involve regional and outside actors. Fourthly, powerful regional actors are displaying an increasingly aggressive behavior, thereby undermining regional stability. And last but not least, we notice an increased interest by new actors from outside the region, often pursuing a selfish and destructive agenda. The combination of these factors makes the situation in the Middle East more volatile and more dangerous than it has been for a very long time. We have to change the negative dynamics in the region and uh, stop moving from bad to worse in the Middle East. Long-term instability in the Middle East will make us all suffer, and most certainly the people in the region. But how do we move forward in the Middle East? First of all, it is for the nations of the regions themselves to create political environments which allow their people to lead a life without fear of repression and torture, hunger and violence, and which instead provides them with safety, dignity and liberty. Dialogue and compromise within the region that bridge religious and ethnic divides are the only sustainable way to reconciliation. As much as the states of the region have to do their share to build peace at home and in the neighborhood, it is not their task alone. The stability of the Middle East has always been a question of global concern. The involvement of the international community comes with increased responsibility. Only if all outside actors look beyond narrow national interests and regional actors invest into lasting stability can we make progress towards a secure Middle East. Thus, the international community cannot stand on the sidelines. But which principles should guide our action? The answer is threefold. Firstly, by fully respecting international law. This is particularly true for international humanitarian law, which, looking at Syria in particular, is too often ignored. Secondly, by taking de-escalatory steps and devising de-escalation strategies. Where international law is disputed or brushed aside, Political processes that promote de-escalation and confidence building need to be put in place. I believe that this has to lie at the heart of our Middle East policy. Today, we are far from providing solutions to the problems of the Middle East, but we can create the foundations for the development of these solutions. And thirdly, by coordination and cooperation of all outside actors and by choosing multilateral solution instead of unilaterally imposed ones. I would like to pick out three brief country files to illustrate this approach. Syria, the bloodshed in Syria must end. Here we have not one, but two platforms of dialogue of the international community. We have the small group and Astana that in theory can reconcile conflicting interests and foster regional cooperation. Bridging those two formats will be key to bring peace to the Syrian people. Germany stands ready to play a role here. Iran. We remain firmly committed to maintaining the JCPOA because under the JCPOA, Iran is subject to the world's most robust nuclear verification regime implemented by the International Atomic Energy Agency. We believe that this is a valuable safeguard to ensure a nuclear weapon-free Iran, and we have not seen any viable alternative to it. At the same time, we are not naive, and we know that the JCPOA is only one part of the puzzle. Iran's regional role, its ballistic program, its threats to maritime security in the Gulf need to be addressed and are being addressed. We do this through political dialogue, and, if need be, through coordinated sanctions. France, the UK, and Germany are right now looking into options of how to foster regional cooperation in maritime security. We are convinced that active de-escalation by all sides will yield positive results, and that an even higher pressure 
and unilateral actions will do the opposite. Israel and Palestine. All in all, I have served almost eight years as a diplomat in Israel. Germany's steadfast commitment to the security of Israel is a cornerstone of our foreign policy, and it is the bedrock of my personal belief. Here, as in the region as a whole, the US is the key stability factor. I hope that it will continue its long-standing policy of supporting both parties towards a negotiated two-state solution. What is badly needed is a resumption of dialogue in the absence of which violence is spreading. In conclusion, today's debate has once again underscored the Middle East offers one of the most intricate webs of political, religious, socio-economic and cultural forces worldwide. It is a fascinating and wonderful region. The people in the Middle East deserve peace and stability. We, the Security Council and the UN as a whole, need to support all initi initiatives which bring us closer to this goal. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency Mr. Mihailis for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. China thanks Poland for the initiative to convene the high-level debate and welcomes Foreign Minister for coming back to New York and presiding over the meeting. China also thanks Ms. Viotti, chef de cabinet of the UN Secretary General, for her briefing. The peace and security in the Middle East is not only having a bearing on the fundamental interest of the countries in the region, but also on global stability and f development. China has always been consistently following the peace and security in the Middle East and has been upholding a objective and impartial position advocating for new security concepts featuring common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security in an effort to build a community with shared future for mankind. I would like to elaborate the following. First, intensifying efforts for political solutions of regional hotspot issues. The hotspot issues in the Middle East are complex, intertwined with one another, and the international community should support the UN in playing central role in good offices, commit to political solutions, promote dialogue and negotiation, adhere to constructive situation control, and consistently take into account legitimate rights and interests of all parties. The sovereignty, independence, unity, territory, and integrity of the country's concern should be respected. China is firmly opposed to the willful use or the threat of use of force. China is against external intervention power politics, and bullying. The issue of Palestine is at the core of the Middle East issue. It is the root problem in the Middle East. Maintaining legitimate Palestinian rights is the common responsibility of the international community. The two-state solution is the only right way to address the Palestinian-Israeli issue. The relevant UN resolutions, Land for Peace Principle, Arab Peace Initiative, are the fundamental principles to be followed in defusing the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The international community should hold high the banner of multilateralism, adhere to fairness and justice, advance the early resumption of peace talks between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and create good conditions for resuming talks. Second, assisting Middle Eastern countries in achieving sustainable development the Middle East turmoil is rooted in poverty and underdevelopment, and its solution ultimately lies in sustainable development. Development bears on the livelihood and dignity of the people and is an essential guarantee for social stability and durable peace. Attention should be given to youth education, employment, and poverty reduction. Just now, Ms. Viotti also mentioned uh, the importance of this issue. Only when the young people gain dignity from development can we see the hope of a future. We should be open-minded in supporting regional countries in exploring development paths in line with their national situations, building mutually beneficial and win-win cooperative partnerships to achieve economic and social progress. Third, building synergies to respond to the threat of terrorism. 
The Middle East is faced with a dire situation of counterterrorism and de-radicalization, with regional countries suffering badly from ter terrorism. The international community should consolidate consensus, unify standards, integrate policies, address the symptoms and root causes of the problems in aggressively countering terrorism and extremist forces. The regional countries should have policy dialogue, intelligence information exchange, and strengthen cooperation in technical cooperation and personnel training, cutting up sources of terrorist financing, fighting against cross-border organized crimes, exchanging experience in deradicalization in an effort to maintain common security and resume regional stability and order. Fourth, preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Efforts should be made to maintain the JCPOA and ensure its effective implementation in its entirety. This is what was set forth in the Council resolutions. It is also the only realistic and effective way to address the Iranian nuclear issue, and it is in conformity with the common interest of the international community. The parties should proceed from the overall and long-term situation, stick to the general direction of political and diplomatic solutions, ensure the balance of rights and obligations under JCPOA, and facilitate a reduction of tension over the Iranian nuclear issue. China will continue to make its effort for a comprehensive and effective implementation of the agreement while firmly maintaining its own legitimate rights and interests. China supports the establishment of a Middle East zone free of nuclear weapons and other WMDs. Mr. President, at present, the Middle East situation is still complex and evolving with ever-increasing security challenges. The challenge of response has gone beyond the power of any one country alone. The United Nations should deepen its cooperation with regional and sub-regional organizations um, such as the Arab League and consolidate and strengthen collective security mechanism. We support countries in the region in developing good neighborly relations on the basis of mutual respect and non-interference of internal affairs. Parties should commit to resolving conflicts through dialogue and consultation, facilitating de-escalation of tension, maintaining regional security and international energy security to avoid igniting new crisis. We welcome any and, all nuclear, uh, any and all dialogue initiatives conducive to achieving peace and security in the Middle East. We welcome the concept of collective security in the Gulf proposed by Russia. China would like to maintain com communication with all parties in this regard. China has always been committed to uh, advance uh, its constructive role for solutions of the uh, hotspot issues in the region. We are keeping our communication with the countries in the region. We support mutual uh, uh, confidence building. We promote uh, uh, talks. You, China has actively participated in all the uh, efforts that are made uh, under the aegis of the United Nations. We uh, took part in, uh, uh, we have a peacekeeping presence in Lebanon and provided substantial humanitarian ass assistance to refugees from the relevant countries so that they have their hope to rebuild their homes. We have also made our efforts for their economic uh, effort. We would also like to strengthen the cooperation with the regional countries and take the rebuilding of Belt and Road as an opportunity so as to provide a development opportunity and pl platform for development in the Middle East. We have always uh, participated in the cooperation with all the parties over the Iranian issues and we are committed to the JCPOA's implementation so as to make our uh, effort for uh, addressing the Iranian issue. China will continue to make our uh, unrelenting effort for the long-term security and prosperous development of the Middle East. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Dominican Republic. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Firstly, I would like to recognize the presence of the Foreign Affairs Minister of Poland and His Excellency Mike Pompeo at today's meeting and thank Madam Ribeiro for her briefing and Mr. Andreas Michelis from Germany. The Middle East demonstrates very many profound divisions and uh, a loss of its religious, ethnic and cultural fabric. This is because of a number of conflicts which are undermining the development and the stability of the area. We see how the territorial integrity of countries such as Syria, Yemen and Libya is being threatened and how millions of people have been displaced from their homes. The impact of this instability has also extended to neighboring countries and beyond. An essential part of this destabilization is caused by the actions of terrorist groups who, in order to achieve their goals, are prepared to sacrifice the lives of innocent civilians, including children. The fight against terrorism is and must continue to be a priority, and it's clear that in order to safeguard the purpose to maintain peace and stability in the region, what is required are efficient mechanisms which will reveal and punish the violations of human rights. Similarly, despite the international legal frameworks to protect women and children, they continue to be the ones who pay the highest price for conflicts in the region. The comprehensive promotion and protection of their rights is vital, but also it is essential that we protect public institutions which play an important role in re-establishing peace and security in the region. Therefore, investing in education is key in order to bring about peace and development in the region. This is the tool that you can give to new generations, the vital link towards normality. Therefore, it's urgent that we protect educational institutions and infrastructure during conflicts, bearing in mind that attacks on these centers limits the ability of children and young people to be able to develop the skills that are necessary for their future. The lack of right to peacefully assemble, the limitations on freedom of expression, early and forced marriage of children, sexual and gender-based violence, and the lack of opportunities for women and young people to be able to participate in decision-making processes are all things which very much limit the region and prevent it uh, bringing about lasting peace and security. The lack of opportunities which arise because of economic, social and climate conditions lead to the displacement of populations and this can lead to conflict. No country is immune from the destabilizing effect of climate change. Fighting it requires collective action. And this is why the United Nations must continue with its efforts to alleviate food insecurity. Similarly, this effect can exacerbate social, economic and institutional vulnerability, which can then become the causes for new conflicts. I think we can appreciate just how much climate change is becoming a multiplier of conflict. Control over weapons of mass destruction and chemical weapons must constitute a priority aspect on, this, on the agenda of this Security Council. We must fight the illicit trafficking in weapons through strengthening measures to control their purchase. This illicit trade exacerbates conflicts. It strengthens terrorist, rebel and criminal groups and it undermines the stability of areas which have been able to calm conflicts. Finally, we would encourage this Council to reaffirm its responsibility and to do everything within its power to stabilize and rec rec reconcile these communities and ensure a return of peace and security which it, they have lost as a, result, as a result of these conflicts. Thank you. 
I thank the representative of the Dominican Republic for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for being with the Council uh, once again and for convening uh, this important debate. Mr. Secretary, thanks to you too uh, for taking the time to join the Council today and uh, welcome also to State Secretary de Michaelis. Mr. President, last year we commemorated the centenary of the end of the First World War that did much to shape the modern Middle East. Many of the conflicts in the region have their origins in the First World War and the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. The end of the First World War also led to the establishment of the League of Nations. This in turn laid the foundation for the United Nations and many of the conflicts that have wrought so much destruction in the region from Syria to Yemen, Libya to Gaza continue to feature heavily on this Council's agenda. The region's current trajectory is troubling and it is fraught with the risk of still further conflagration and conflict. Ms. Viotti mentioned the difficulty of managing escalation in today's world. And while our efforts at multilateral solutions have not always worked out as well as we might have hoped, the alternative looks decidedly worse. Experience tells us that however imperfect, de-escalation and dialogue, political processes and support for the rules-based international system are the best means to address tensions that risk undermining our collective interests in security, stability and prosperity. We know this is true around the world. It's so true of the situation in the Middle East today. And that's why the United Kingdom remains a steadfast supporter of the UN and this Council's efforts to resolve international conflict. Mr. President, Secretary Pompeo, State Secretary de Michaelis mentioned the importance of regional efforts. And a number of members of this Council uh, have in recent weeks, the most recent being our Russian colleagues, uh, mentioned also uh, the importance of finding a way uh, to address collectively uh, some of the underlying challenges. Uh, this may well, Mr. President, be an idea uh, whose time is yet to come, uh, not least because the region itself uh, needs to be ready uh, for such work. But we believe it's important that we look in an exploratory way uh, at what might be possible and where we might start. Uh, one option might be to start with the most recent travel spot, the Strait of Hormuz, and to start serious, inclusive dialogue between regional and international actors as the State Secretary from Germany set out. Mr. President, Secretary Pompeo touched today on Iran's role in the region. My country has great respect for the Iranian people. We respect Iran's culture. It is an ancient culture and one that features alongside the great developments in classical history in Europe. We accept that Iran has a legitimate role in the Middle East and we accept, like all of us, she has a right to self-defense but we cannot ignore the fact that the way she pursues her national interests contributes to several of the regional problems we're discussing today. When I addressed the Council in the 2231 format in June, I reiterated that the priority of UK policy towards Iran was to prevent Iran achieving a nuclear capability that would threaten the stability and security of the Middle East region and belong. <clears throat> and as the German representative set out, we continue to judge that this objective is best served by efforts to preserve the nuclear deal, the JCPOA. We urge Iran to return to full compliance with the deal. It is in none of our interests to see the deal unravel. It's an essential part of the global non-proliferation architecture, and it is critical for our national security and for the shared security of our partners and allies. There is no better solution. There is no alternative. The UK, with France and Germany, has been consistently clear that we will work to support the deal. We remain fully committed to the delivery of the INSTEX mechanism, ensuring that legitimate trade with Iran can continue. We continue to participate in core projects within the deal, including taking on the role of co-chair of the ARAC modernization project. And we welcome President Macron's efforts to find a way through to dialogue in close coordination with the E3. Mr. President, 
the JCPOA is not a license for Iran to roam free across the conflicts in the Middle East. Iran continues to support proxies across the region that undermine the regional security and violate this Council's resolutions, whether Security Council Resolution 1559 in Lebanon or 2216 and the arms embargo on Yemen. And we regret that rather than backing a political solution in Syria in line with Resolution 2254, Iran has instead chosen to support Assad in pursuing a military solution, including through organizing and sending sectarian militia to Syria, which has helped fuel that conflict. This pattern of Iranian behavior poses a serious danger to peace and stability. Secretary Pompeo mentioned that on 19 July, a British flag tanker, Steno Impero, was boarded by Iranian forces while transiting through the Straits of Hormuz inside Omani territorial waters. The Steno Impero remains seized. As the chef de cabinet noted, it is imperative that we defend freedom of navigation in the Strait of Hormuz to reassure the global shipping industry and to deter further attacks. This is not just a British aim, uh, Mr. President. It's in every nation's interest, and it requires the coming together of international nations to support maritime security in the Gulf. I won't touch much today, Mr. President, on Syria, because this council has very many meetings uh, on that sad conflict. But I will simply note that there can be no reconstruction without a sustainable UN-led political process on the basis of Resolution 2254. With regards to the Iranian vessel Grace One, we have welcomed Gibraltar's recent actions and legal proceedings to implement EU sanctions, and these are in place to pressure the Assad regime towards negotiations. We understand that Iran has provided assurances to the government of Gibraltar that the vessel and its cargo will not go to an EU-sanctioned entity like Syria. Iran needs, Mr. President, Iran needs to abide by these assurances. In Idlib, we urgently need a ceasefire to prevent further suffering, and we need answers, Mr. President, as to why and how international humanitarian law is being so flagrantly violated by the regime and its allies. And I want to recall, if I may, that such crimes confer individual and personal responsibility on the perpetrators. The violations also continue to create space for radicalization and further extremism, and Daesh continues to pose a serious threat across the region. In Iraq, we cannot take for granted the progress that's been made, providing security and stability for the Iraqi people. The United Kingdom, alongside the international community, will continue to support the government of Iraq to ensure that the conditions that gave rise to Daesh are tackled. The situation in Libya is in danger of deteriorating still further, and over the past four months, it's become clear neither side can win a military victory. The only winners of the current conflict are the terrorist and extremist groups who look to exploit the chaos and instability for their own ends. As others have said, Mr. President, the way forward is for the parties to comply with their obligations under international law and to commit to political dialogue and a lasting ceasefire. Likewise, a political solution is urgently needed in Yemen, not only to end the conflict, but to alleviate the immense humanitarian suffering. We urge the parties to agree the latest UN proposals to allow for wider political discussions. The concerning events in Aden highlight the need for an inclusive political process, and we welcome the initiative taken by His Majesty King Salman to resolve the situation. Mr. President, in the context of heightened tensions in the region, it's more important than ever that the Lebanese government and all Lebanese parties implement Lebanon's policy of disassociation from regional conflicts. We call on all parties to implement the relevant resolutions in full, particularly 1559, and 1701. For our part, Mr. President, we will continue to help build the strength and capacity of the Lebanese state to resist encroachment by Hezbollah. Uh, we will help Lebanon uh, achieve its economic stability, making swift progress on implementing the commitments made at the CEDRE conference. 
I want to take this opportunity to commend Unifil's role in maintaining calm and stability along the blue line, but I stress at the same time the importance of enabling Unifil to deliver its mandate unimpeded. It is unacceptable that Unifil is still unable to access Hezbollah tunnel sites in southern Lebanon. Mr. President, other speakers have addressed the question of a sustainable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As the chef de cabinet said, it's the longest running international peace and security issue here. For the United Kingdom, our position on the two-state solution remains unchanged. We urge the US administration to bring forward its detailed proposals for a viable peace agreement that addresses the legitimate concerns of both parties. US efforts to support the development of the Palestinian economy are very welcome, and it's essential that political progress is made in order to unlock economic opportunities. But as we've said in the Council before, until there is political progress, steps do need to be taken to address the constraints imposed on the Palestinian economy by the Israeli occupation. We want to see increasing trade opportunities for the Palestinians' external trade, and we want to see the financial sustainability of the Palestinian Authority realized. Mr. President, only a safe and secure Israel, living alongside a viable and sovereign Palestinian state based on 1967 borders, with Jerusalem as a shared capital of both states, can bring a lasting solution. Uh, Mr. President, I've concentrated today on the geopolitical and international peace and security aspects as the most immediate challenges uh, that face us. Uh, but you, Mr. President, and a number of other speakers rightly drew attention to the vital importance of economic and social development, uh, notably for women. Uh, and I share uh, the importance uh, of this area. Uh, but I do want to make clear it's not an excuse, though, for certain governments to divert funds that could better be spent at home on the very real things that help build the state uh, into uh, violence, persecution, and adventurism. You spoke about good governance, education, and youth. Uh, I want to stress our new Prime Minister's interest in advancing girls' education uh, in particular, uh, but it's also true that investment, equality before the law, and rule of law are also fundamental, and Secretary Pompeo set out how the Warsaw process includes economic and public policy factors. To come back to where I started, uh, Mr. President, uh, we cannot see the um, countries of the Middle East exploit fully the opportunity to modernize their economies uh, when we see this sort of pushback on women's rights that the chef de cabinet mentioned. The current tensions and instability in the Middle East serve no one. I want to call again for de-escalation, for full respect for international rules, and for engagement and dialogue through which the region can discuss its problems transparently and in the interests of the populations there who have suffered so much. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for her statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Belgium. Merci. Thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, I should like to thank Madame Viotti, Chef de Cabinet, uh, Executive Office of the Secretary General, for her edifying briefing on this difficult matter, which is of concern to us all. Building peace and security for all within the Middle East and in the Gulf region is indeed of paramount importance in the efforts of the United Nations and of the Security Council. Hence, we welcome the opportunity to tackle this matter in a cross-cutting manner today at your initiative, sir, and in the presence of, his, of their excellencies, Mr. Pompeo and uh, uh, Mr. Michaelis, we align ourselves with the statement to be delivered by the European Union. Sir, the Middle East and the Gulf region are plagued by myriad tensions and conflict. These are frequently inscribed on the agenda of this Council. The conflicts in Syria, in Yemen, and in Libya, the deadlock in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, 
the risk of instability in Lebanon, tensions in the Strait of Hormuz, the Iranian nuclear dossier, the fight against Daesh and Al-Qaeda. These are all elements which imperil regional security, but also due to their international nature, they also jeopardize international peace and security, of which this council is a guarantor. However, these agenda items are too frequently tackled in a piecemeal fashion. As has been seen within this council, interactive informal dialogue on the Middle East and North Africa, this was held on 21 March last, and the briefing on cooperation between the United Nations and the League of Arab States held 13 June. As reflected in those events, it is of critical importance that a regional and multidimensional approach be crafted. Such a regional approach will enable the root causes uh, for tensions and conflict to be taken into account, as well as regional uh, dynamics and shared security challenges which underpin them. This can be aligned with the three essential and interdependent pillars which remain relevant. They are as follows, uh, security and political aspects uh, to build and set out a shared area for peace and security, economic and financial aspects to create a space for shared prosperity, social, cultural, and human aspects to foster new inclusive social contracts based on education, economic opportunities for young people, equality for women, respect for human rights, and equitable distribution of national wealth. With respect to the first point and security Security aspects. Weapons of mass destruction, particularly chemical and nuclear weapons of mass destruction, remain a, a key point of focus. Use of chemical weapons by whomsoever in any location is unacceptable and at variance with international standards. For my country, disarmament, non proliferation, and the fight against impunity for the use of chemical weapons are prioritized. It is of paramount importance that there be accountability for chemical attacks in Syria. In the same vein, Resolution 2231 remains the best available multilateral framework to engage Iran on nuclear nonproliferation issues and their impact on both regional stability and international security. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, should be safeguarded and the challenges which it currently is encountering should be surmounted through the verification mechanisms agreed to with the IAEA. It helps to build the trust which is so necessary. Mr. President, uh, uh, Belgium seeks to build peace and forge consensus, and in this regard we shall continue to lend our full support to shoring up the role of the United Nations and of this Council to initiate a regional, horizontal, and multidimensional approach to address tensions and conflict gripping the Middle East and the Gulf. Only a concerted approach that brings in all actors in the region and that tackles all issues faced can help to deliver on peace and security in the region in a lasting way in a manner that fully upholds multilateralism and the global rules-based order. Let us recall that during the Arab Spring in 2011, people mobilized to claim their rights their freedom, equality, democracy, and economic opportunities. Some of these expectations remain unmet. Any lasting solution in the region needs to hinge on ownership of this by the societies and by the people. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Belgium for her statement. I now give the floor to the representative of France. Mr. President. Mr. President, thank you for having organized this debate, which enables us to address all of the challenging issues in the Middle East in a spirit of dialogue, because the conflicts in the region have common roots, and they're linked between them. Therefore, this cross-cutting approach is relevant and is a complement to the items that are on the agenda of this Council. I welcome here the participation of, the, of Mr. Pompeo, Secretary of State, United States, and I would particularly like to thank Mr. Michelis, State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office. And I also endorse the statement that will be delivered by the Chargé d'Affaires of the European Union. 
Firstly, I would like to refer to the challenges facing the region. I think, first of all, of the security challenges with the persistence of the terrorist threat, despite the territorial victory over Daesh in Syria and in Iraq. Over and above a military response, the challenge of violent radicalization will not be resolved unless we have inclusive political solutions that are accompanied by an increased effort to stabilize the liberated areas and to rebuild there where the political conditions are in place. France will also continue to be mobilized to remove the sources of funding for terrorism in accordance with Resolution 2462 of the Council adopted in March. Mr. President, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their means of delivery towards state and non-state actors is a threat to all of us, and we must provide collective responses. Here I would like to reaffirm our vigilance with, with regard to respect for the prohibition on the use of chemical weapons, since the Syrian regime and Daesh have used them. France reaffirms also its full attachment to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, Today, there is no alternative to prevent nuclear proliferation in Iran. We have already had the occasion to say this. We do regret the American withdrawal from this agreement. The remaining signatories, including France, remain determined to preserve the JCPOA, and we continue to respect its commitments. We are extremely concerned by the measures recently taken by Iran in violation of its obligations under the agreement. No legal provision authorizes the non-respect for part of these commitments. This is why we must all work to preserve this agreement and to ensure that Iran returns to full compliance with its obligations. France remains resolutely committed in this regard together with our partners. Over and above this, we must build a long-term strategy. This cannot simply be the politics of pressure, of sanctions. Only a global approach will make it possible to resolve the various outstanding issues in the uh, nuclear um, issue, for example, 2035, as well as following up on the ballistic efforts of Iran and regional stability. Mr. President, secondly, I think of the political challenges confronting the region facing conflicts and uh, instability, and the civilian population are the first victims in Syria and Yemen, where violations of humanitarian international law are happening on a daily basis. The increasing shelling uh, by the Syrian regime and its ally Russia in Idlib are particularly of concern. I recall here the call of France for an immediate cessation of hostilities and the implementation of the agreement concluded in Sochi between Russia and Turkey and Germany. Uh, the Astana Group uh, should be able to facilitate progress in this area. In Yemen, we must ensure rapid humanitarian access, comprehensive and unhindered, to all populations and implement the Stockholm Agreements. Over and above this, the country requires a resumption of political dialogue uh, without preconditions. Mr. President, in this context, over and above the urgent response to crises, we must work to implement pluralistic and inclusive political solutions which will guarantee the stability of the region in the long term. The priority is to prevent conflicts and to bring about de-escalation through dialogue. This is particularly important given current tensions in the Gulf. In this context, we must work with states in the region who are in the front line. We must work with our international partners and also within relevant international multilateral organizations and ensure the implementation of an inclusive and balanced dialogue and in the long term, trust building measures which will guarantee free passage uh, for shipping through the straits. We must also promote the implementation of inclusive political solutions under the aegis of the United Nations. We must work to strengthen state institutions that are strong but which respect the rule of law and human rights, which protect freedoms, and all the components of pluralistic societies in the Middle East. In this regard, I would like to encourage the Iraqi authorities to continue with their efforts to rebuild the areas freed from Daesh and to bring about reconciliation between all Iraqis. In Syria, only a political, credible solution will be able to reduce the destabilizing potential of the crisis and to bring about lasting peace. Women must participate fully in the peace process and the implementation of these political solutions. This is a moral imperative and, addition, and an additional chance to maintain peace and security. Finally, I would like to stress the attachment of France to multilateralism and to the role of the United Nations and also for respect of international law. 
Any unilateral decision which diverges from international law considerably weakens the order which is founded on international law, including the collective capacity to successfully implement peace processes. In this regard, I would recall that lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians can only be assured through a fair and balanced solution based on the establishment of two states living side by side in security with recognized borders and having both of them Jerusalem as their capital in accordance with the internationally agreed parameters and the resolutions of this council. It is also against this background that we provide support to UNRWA uh, for its work to help Palestinian refugees. This is essential for regional stability. Mr. President, this council has an essential role to play. It is the prime guarantor for international law. Amongst other things, it must recall to all belligerents to a conflict to respect applicable law, particularly international humanitarian law and human rights, and to provide unanimous support to the efforts of the United Nations, particularly through the support of this Council to the envoys and representatives of the Secretary-General. Finally, France will continue to defend multilateralism as a method to guarantee and maintain international peace and security. It is by calling this into question that today we weaken our security, particularly with regard to institutions and the international instruments and mechanisms to fight impunity and non-proliferation. Mr. President, in conclusion, France has no intention of renouncing our principles or our commitment to respond to the crisis in the Middle East or our willingness to see this Council play a greater role in these conflicts. The region is traumatized. So many societies that have been damaged by the scourge of war. However, we need to preserve uh, peace. The inhabitants of the region want to live in peace and security. This implies that we learn from le lessons of the past and that we don't repeat the same mistakes. We need to stop this destructive violence. We can do this if we're clear about the uh, uh, forces um, in the area. We want a balanced solution and implement a balanced policy of dialogue so that countries and peoples of the region can find a point of understanding and become good neighbors and opt for a pluralistic share out of power. This means respecting all relevant resolutions of our Council. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for her statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Peru. Señor Presidente, queremos... Mr. President, we would like to thank the Polish Presidency for the initiative of convening this high-level debate and for the concept paper which calls upon us to think about the current conflicts in the Middle East in the area of peace and security. We particularly welcome here the presence of uh, yourself, Minister, and we would like to thank Madame Viotti for her important briefing this afternoon. Peru, due to our Hispanic heritage, has forged and maintained solid links with the Middle East. We recognize the rich cultural, religious, and ethnic diversity of its peoples, as well as its consistent desire for peace and prosperity. Therefore, we regret that the region continues to be an area of very many violent confrontations increasing in scale and violence leading to serious violations of uh, humanitarian law and uh, human rights leading to enormous suffering for the civilian population. The hundreds of thousands of victims in Syria after more than nine years of bloody fighting, the never-ending famine and outbreaks of disease that we see in Yemen, and the confinement and the lack of hope and opportunities for the population of Gaza are just some examples of this crude reality. This dramatic situation is also worsened by threats caused by terrorist groups and criminal organizations, as well as by the configuration of the Middle East as a large-scale sa sales market for diverse military equipment. Mr. President, we feel that the international community can contribute by supporting the building of institutions that are solid and inclusive, that are able to prevent and resolve the various differences which, of course, naturally occur amongst the peoples of this region. This means that we need to strengthen capacity to address the expectations of the population, to protect and promote their human rights, and to recognize their legitimate aspirations, in particular those of minorities, women, and young people. 
This also means that we need to consolidate the rule of law to promote economic growth and to align humanitarian assistance with development plans that provide hope and opportunity to the civilian population in accordance with the sustainable development goals of the 2030 Agenda. Another great challenge is to address the serious situation facing millions of refugees and internally displaced, which presupposes not only the availability of financial resources, but also principally there needs to be political willingness in order to guarantee safe and dignified return under internationally accepted conditions. Mr. President, this organization and this council in particular have a crucial role to play by insisting upon full compliance with its resolutions to ensure unconditional respect for international humanitarian law and human rights as an essential way of protecting the civilian population, to strengthen international cooperation in order to effectively fight against terrorism and to preserve the non-proliferation regimes with regard to weapons of mass destruction. A special priority should also be given to conflict prevention, which presupposes coordinating strategic action for mediation and facilitation, dialogue facilitation, early warning and trust-building measures, as well as giving greater visibility to good practices and to provide assistance to those countries which wish to replicate these good practices. Basically, we need to guarantee the preservation of an international rules-based order as the basic minimum for living together in today's turbulent and interdependent world. To achieve this, Peru would stress that any no analysis of the Middle East can overcome the need to resolve the issue of the question of Palestine which involves promoting the resumption of direct negotiations that will lead to, the res to two states. The Arab Peace Initiative, which is still fully in force and relevance, should help to achieve this goal. This opportunity is also appropriate to reiterate our c condemnation of the attacks that we have seen on vessels in the Straits of Hormuz, which puts at risk the freedom of navigation in this area that is so important strategically and globally and exacerbates tensions. We would call upon all those involved to act with moderation under these dangerous circumstances and to avoid new unilateral acts being committed that could lead to a conflict in the region with uh, unpredictable consequences. I would like to conclude by saying that we are at a critical point in time and the efforts of the international community should, as a priority, try to avoid a greater fragmentation in the Middle East and bring about stability in the long term. Thank you. I thank the representative of Peru for his statement, and now I give the floor to the representative of Kuwait. Shukran, Sayyid Rais. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank you for choosing today's topic. I also welcome the Secretary of State of the United States and the State Secretary of the Republic of Germany. I thank them for being with us today, and I thank the Chef de Cabinet of the Secretary General, and I thank her for her briefing, and I express the support of the State of Kuwait to the statement to be delivered by the representative of the United Arab Emirates on behalf of the Arab group. The Middle East continues to occupy a significant portion of the agenda of the Security Council, around 30 to 40 percent. The region has witnessed many wars and conflicts over the past seven decades. This region is the cradle of the three monotheistic religions and human civilizations and cultures where some of the oldest cities of the world exist. It has so many resources. It's unfortunate that it is witnessing such security and political upheavals. I would like to address this topic from three angles. One, conflicts and means of prevention. The United Nations in general, and the Security Council in particular, is dealing with over eight files in the Middle East. One for over half a century, such as the Palestinian question, and others for many years, such as Syria, Yemen, the Sudan, and Libya. Currently, five Arab countries witness a part of their territories or parts of their territories are being occupied. Our region is countering terrorism on five fronts. Our region is witnessing six internal conflicts. 
Six Arab countries have peacekeeping operations out of 14 missions, and add to that, over more than one-third of refugees and displaced persons around the world are inside the Arab region. The one common denominator, the occupation, which is the raison d'etre, and the pretense of violent and terrorist ideological movements that exacerbate these conflicts. On more than one occasion, we have repeated that resolving the Palestinian question lies in the fact of ensuring the rights of the Palestinians to their land and their state by implementing Security Council resolutions and ending the occupation and establishing a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. The policies of Israel since this joined the United Nations have had one thing in common, the non-adherence to the Charter of the United Nations and not implementing resolutions of international legitimacy with impunity. The Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory, the Syrian Golan, and Lebanese territory is the root cause of many problems in the Middle East. For many years, we have tried to contain these conflicts and address their implications. We must move from addressing the root causes to preventing these conflicts. We recall that the Charter of the United Nations is our guarantee and primary means to prevent conflicts. There are initiatives on the table for several years now rejected by Israel, such as creating a Middle East free from weapons of mass destruction. The state of Kuwait has sought to enhance regional security by creating, for instance, the Gulf Cooperation Council in 1981, or by providing mediation to resolve differences in the region since the first years of our independence until this very day. We even helped open channels of dialogue with the Islamic Republic of Iran based on mutual respect, principles of good neighborliness and non-interference in the internal affairs and the respect of the sovereignty of all countries of the Gulf and not taking any unilateral measures that could exacerbate matters further and might undermine energy security in the world, which could threaten international peace and security. At the humanitarian level, yesterday we celebrated the World Humanitarian Day, and today we recall that our action must be focused on people and based on the law. We must seek to provide a decent life to the peoples in the region and the world in times of peace and war. We have joined France and the group of countries to defend civilians and civilian infrastructures, schools and hospitals from being targeted in times of war. We have suffered from such acts during the occupation of the Kuwait when international humanitarian law was violated many times and therefore we, have, we took it upon ourselves to guarantee that everyone respects international humanitarian law. Refugees and displaced persons from Arab countries now exceeds 24 million out of 70 million around the world, more than one-third. You can only imagine how many lives, properties, opportunities were lost, how many people had to emigrate Arab countries to seek a better life. Therefore, political solutions to the problems of the region remains our priority, Ending the occupation is one of these solutions. We do hope that the United Nations, particularly the Security Council, will play a bigger role to guarantee that its resolutions are being implemented. Third, education and culture. Conflicts and wars have, have displaced many, and we are dealing with these implications. However, we can invest in the future, and we can make sure that refugees, migrants, do not suffer further, we can give them a decent life by investing in education first and foremost. And this is one of the areas where Kuwait is providing assistance to our brethren and friends through official assistance so that we can build a generation that builds peace. We 
invest in our future so that we do not forget the past. For hundreds of years, people from different religions and cultures have lived in our region. Not one opinion or one story can destroy the stories of others, and no crime can be justified when culture, the cultural heritage of our peoples is being destroyed. Trading in the cultures of the civilizations of the Middle East is to be added to the crimes of terrorists when they destroyed our culture. They have sought to destroy neighborhoods, old neighborhoods and cities. They have, furthermore, the occupation authorities have sought to destroy the cultural identity of East Jerusalem and Palestinians all over Palestine. In conclusion, we thank Poland for choosing today's topic. We have tried to address many of its aspects, which could be summarized as follows. Respecting people and international law. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Kuwait for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Russian Federation. Thank you. Mr. Minister, I also wish to thank the Chef de Cabinet, Executive Office of the Secretary General, Madam Maria Luisa Ribeiro Viotti, for the report on the situation in the Middle East. We listened attentively to the statements delivered by colleagues, uh, including, in addition to you, Mr. Minister, we wish to highlight and welcome uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Mike Pompeo, and the State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany, Mr. Andreas Michaelis. It is no secret to anyone that presently the Middle East is encountering serious crises. These are existentialist crises for a number of states. In order to attempt to arrive at solutions to these crises, it is important not only to look forward, but also to look backward so as to understand the errors that were made and to attempt to avoid these errors in the future. In our view, the most meaningful conclusion which we should draw from the experience of the past two decades is as follows. Unilateral action of any kind does not bring us closer to settling protracted and new problems plaguing the region. This situation is all the more devastating when certain United Nations member states attempt to position other member states above the law. The uh, policies of fomenting tumult and ousting regimes uh, that are inconvenient to certain capitals, which spawn from these actions, not only has this, tri has this uh, not led to settlement to uh, problems in the region, but this has also created new, exceedingly dangerous problems for the region, which have led to greater bloodshed. It is clear to us, as it is to most of our partners, that uh, the only way to extricate ourselves from the situation is to bring together international and regional efforts under the central role of the United Nations and its Security Council. It is indeed in this chamber where it is important to confirm that this premise needs to become the starting point for all of the relevant efforts and initiatives. Geopolitical engineering, intervention in domestic affairs, imposition of military solutions has led to the collapse of entire states, has caused tragedy and the death of hundreds of thousands of residents in that region. It will be no exaggeration to state that ultimately many states have fallen hostage to the short-sighted goals of external players and they were forced to engage in proxy wars that were devastating for their national interests. Mr. Pompeo, we listened closely and attentively to your statement. I even asked my colleagues uh, to, de to look at it verbatim because there is indeed a lot which hinges on your statement. A great deal depends on it. And it turned out that you used many words uh, that have a negative connotation. Ch threats, challenges, deterrence, conflict, regime, uh, limitations, restrictions, opposition, and threats. 
Only once did you use the word cooperation, and this was in the context of a coalition against Iran. Not once did you use the word dialogue. As we see it, those two words, those two notions underpin any and all diplomatic efforts. We also noted that uh, you spoke in an emotionally charged way about the Persian Gulf, and you spoke at length about that. We, too, are very concerned about the situation in that region. However, the difference lies in the fact that from the very beginning, you are cobbling together a coalition against Iran, portraying that country as the main and virtually sole source of problems, a kind of empire of evil, so to speak. Moreover, of late we have observed the tensions that have been festering the middle in the Persian Gulf, and this, in our view, these tensions are largely fomented and stoked in an artificial manner amid ongoing exchange of recriminations. There is a military presence that is being built up, including of extra-regional states. This creates risks of armed confrontation. Any incident is liable to spark a conflict, a conflict with potentially devastating consequences. We appeal to all parties to exercise restraint, to strive to achieve de-escalation and to settle problems politically and diplomatically. This means, above all, that there's a need to eschew ultimatums, sanctions, and threats. Uh, in the light of the relevance of forging a resilient mechanism for collective security within the region on the basis of equitable dialogue, the Russian Federation has advanced and presented, including at the United Nations, a blueprint for collective security in the Persian Gulf region. And this, indeed, is geared towards breaking the deadlock in the conflicts, uh, towards crafting trust building and oversight measures. We are of the view that the security system in the Persian Gulf needs to be inclusive, universal, and holistic in nature. It should include the engagement on equal footing of all states in the region with the establishment of the relevant organizational structures. The intent is for such a system to become the prologue to building a shared post-crisis architecture in the Middle East. The exclusion of any party is not acceptable. The entire scenario of cobbling together situational, temporary coalitions of mutual interests, as practice shows, lead to grim consequences alone. This uh, one-sided initiative uh, also includes what was mentioned today during uh, the Ministerial Conference of Warsaw held last February. Our approach to this event was repeatedly set out by us publicly when it was being prepared. We noted that uh, the decisions on the format for the conduct of this conference and its agenda were taken hastily in a concealed way without the conduct of meaningful consultations with the UN and key regional and extra-regional players. Uh, there were contradictions uh, in this approach, and we pointed this, uh, this contradiction with uh, being at odds with the organizer's strategy for establishment of peace in the Middle East. We explicitly said that we see therein another attempt to, to impose a unilateral solution for the international community, unilateral solutions to advance parochial geopolitical geopolitical agendas. The ultimately, the outcomes rather of this event fully bore out those assessments. So frankly speaking, we see no added value in the efforts of the Warsaw format. Turning to Russian proposals, they can and they should be supplemented and be made a reality. These are a sort of inv invitation to engage in constructive dialogue on ways to achieve long-term stabilization in the Persian Gulf area. We stand ready to engage in close contact with all stakeholders, both through official channels and through socio-political and expert circles. I wish specifically to note that to, to advance expert-level dialogue on this issue, on the 18th to the 19th of September in Moscow, there are plans to hold an international expert-level roundtable at the Institute of Eastern Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences.
Mr. Minister, we have always embraced the view that negotiations are possible under any circumstances, in any situation, provided the parties stand ready to engage in such negotiations in a mutually respectful way on the basis of the principles of international law, diplomatic practice, and courtesy. For this reason, for us, as well as for the overwhelming majority of states in the region, we cannot be satisfied by a situation where calls for Iran to sit down at the negotiating table are punctuated with direct insults and demeaning sanctions. Direct provocations and demeaning sanctions. This is an approach that one could hardly expand, uh, could, one could hardly justifiably expect a response from, the inter, uh, from Iran in the light of this approach. To be frank, we see no logic behind the fact that our U.S. colleagues in breach of Security Council Resolution 2231 are now calling upon Iran to begin negotiations without any preconditions. We cannot overlook the fact that 80% of Iranian trade flow falls under the illegitimate unilateral American sanctions, which furthermore are also extraterritorial in nature. This is a ploy to force all parties to bow to the will of Washington. It also here it is appropriate to recall the fact that in this way the United States uh, uh, trampling upon the norms of international law essentially is attempting to uh, uh, to punish those countries who are strictly complying with the resolution's provisions, the provisions of Resolution 2231. I wish to assure you nonetheless that even given this uh, difficult circumstances, we will continue to seek to persuade both our Iranian and United States colleagues of the fact that it's important to step away from this dangerous precipice, uh, to begin to engage in a settlement through civilized dialogue, which provides for an end to ultimatums, sanctions, and blackmail. Mr. Minister, like as was the case many decades ago, at the heart is the problem, are the problems facing the Middle East. The state of affairs in the Middle East peace process remains unsatisfactory. The situation in the West Bank is not improving, nor is the situation in Eastern Jerusalem improving. There, Israel continues to engage in settlement activities and continues to demolish Palestinian buildings. This activity not only is illegal under international law, but this also constitutes one of the gravest obstacles to the establishment of a fair, lasting, and comprehensive peace in the Middle East. At the same time, there are persistent attempts ongoing of unil to unilaterally impose alternative arrangements for a settlement. These undermine the parameters that have long ago been set out and acknowledged by the international community to resolve the Palestinian issues. The intent to create a smokescreen over seeking a, a lasting, comprehensive solution uh, to this issue, in our view, is counterproductive. Uh, in the absence of promising political horizons, no economic surrogates can create the necessary conditions for full-fledged enjoyment by uh, the Palestinian people of their national aspirations. The core principles of establishment of two states for two peoples remains a cornerstone upon which the foundation for a future stable and peaceful future for the Palestinian Israelis can be built. We call upon the leaders uh, the, the, for not narrow political interests to be ad, uh, advanced, but rather the shared legal basis for Middle East settlement to be embraced. This includes the rel relevant Security Council resolutions, the Madrid principles, and the Arab Peace Initiative. For our part, we intend to coordinate our action with our Palestinian and Israeli partners, states in the Middle East and North African region, and the parties to the Middle East Quartet of International Mediators. Mr. Minister, alongside the Palestinian issue, there are outstanding regional crises of a new generation, if I may put it that way. The counterterrorism operation conducted by the Russian Aerospace Forces of Russia and Syria had, has led to headway being made in the fight against terrorism. The eradication of the terrorist hotbed in Syria 
aligns with the interests not only of the Middle East and North Africa, but also European interests, insofar as it will lessen the low of terrorist threat uh, stemming from the area and will lessen the flow of migrants from the area. I wish to stress that never and nowhere did we agree that uh, the terrorists can remain in Syria, anywhere in Syria, or feel themselves to be comfortable in Syria. For this reason, we call for there to be collective efforts and for double standards in counterterrorism to be abandoned. I will be frank, we continue to advocate a wide-ranging counterterrorism front. We continue to strive to establish a political settlement in Syria. We are doing this in conjunction with the United Nations under the Astana format. We advocate the unification of regional efforts. It is important now to deal with uh, issues related to the socioeconomic recovery of the Syrian Arab Republic without preconditions. It is important to tackle issues faced by refugees and to cast aside the practice of their forced detention in third countries. The focus of our shared attention, of course, needs to be on the situation in Libya. We are of the view that assistance to Libyans in extricating themselves from the crisis can only be delivered through consolidating the positions of international players. The developments show what the consequences are of foreign military interventions. In Libya, as a result of this intervention, there has been a full, utter collapse of its statehood. We call upon all Libyan stakeholders to cooperate with the United Nations and not to advance unilateral agendas. Equally, these approaches are necessary vis-a-vis -vis Yemen. There, all parties need to operate under the unifying basis set out by the United Nations to revive the statehood and to combat terrorism and to transition to building good neighborly relations. Mr. Minister, uh, to conclude, I wish to stress that it will be no exaggeration to state that the alarming trends I have described have led the, the situation in the Middle East to a chasm, a gulf from all directions. At the same time, it is necessary to note that this is escalated through the propagandistic warfare, which is in the spirit of the grimmest chapter of the Cold War. The number of fake news reports circulated by various NGOs, which receive financing from a number of Western capitals, is astoundingly high. Unfortunately, on the basis of these mendacious and highly contentious uh, data, uh, unilateral decisions are taken. This not only undermines efforts to resolve conflict, but also undermines the entire system of international relations. These are pretexts uh, where uh, uh, enemies are identified, in, and at the same time, the real threats are being ignored, and these real threats require collective efforts being undertaken. This is an approach where we won't go far with. The earlier our Western partners understand this, the sooner together, together on the basis of the aspirations of the peoples of the region can we finally address the problems plaguing the area, both protracted and new issues. And for the moment, I wish to assure you that we stand ready to do so under any format of multilateral or bilateral cooperation or dialogue under the stewardship and the leading role of the Security Council on the basis of positive agendas without any double standards and without concealed goals and with, of course, the unconditional respect for the sovereignty of the Middle East states and the rights and aspirations of their peoples. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of Russian Federation for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of South Africa. Mr. President, thank you, uh, Minister, for once more presiding over the Council deliberations. And thank for the police delegation con for convening this debate on the challenges to peace and security in the Middle East. My direction also appreciates the insightful briefings of Ms. Viotti, the chef de cabinet in the SG's executive office. We also welcome you, Secretary of State.
and thanks for your speech, as well as the um, State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office in Germany. You are welcome, sir. Mr. President, South Africa welcomes the debate on threats and challenges to peace and security in the Middle East and wish to emphasize that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to these challenges given the diversity of the challenges to each of the countries in the region. The destruction of property and infrastructure caused by bombing in the Middle East is unprecedented and devastating. The satellite pictures of the region show destruction resembling ruins last seen in the last Second World War, 75, 74 years ago. The unprecedented and human suffering, destruction of physical and social infrastructure should be stopped. Millions of women and children have perished and permanently disfigured. Millions internally displaced and yet millions more made refugees in far away lands, some since childhood. They have never known peace. The upsurge in radicalization of youth and terror-linked insurgent groupings which are causing havoc in the region and spreading beyond is of great concern to South Africa. Mr. President, South Africa family believes that the question of Palestine-Israel remains the core issue which, whose resolution will have a positive impact on the entire region for many, many generations to come. South Africa is deeply concerned by the immediate cost to the various conflicts in the Middle East, which remains the most acute of any other region, as can be illustrated by the prolonged and continuous suffering of refugees, terrorist displaced persons, and those caught in the midst of armed conflict in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and other places. We call on the international community to pay equal attention to Yemen, which continues to be the most humanitarian crisis in the world, and call on the parties to Yemen conflict to respect international marine law, including Stockholm Agreement. South Africa regrets the withdrawal of the United States from JCPOA, and we continue to urge our friends in the USA to consider their position in this regard. The JCPOA is the most important diplomatic achievement in the area of nuclear non-proliferation in a very, very long time. The significant multilateral success that contributes to the maintenance of eternal peace and security. We also urge Iran to continue abiding by its obligations under the JCPOA. Mr. President, South Africa believes that in order to address the root causes of the peace and security challenge in the Middle East, the Council needs to display the necessity political will and good faith to resolve long-standing and festering conflicts such as the question of Palestine, which has been a source of tension in the region for many decades. Mr. President, South Africa believes that the only multilateral collective action and a continued commitment to preventive diplomacy and inclusive dialogue as opposed to confrontation and conflict will reduce such tensions, culminating in a more peaceful and prosperous region so rich in diversity, culture, and civilization. In conclusion, Mr. President, Saga would also like to emphasize the importance of the implementation of the Nuclear non proliferation Treaty and the importance of the objectives of attaining a nuclear-free Middle East. In Syria, the Geneva Agreement should be implemented. In Yemen, the Stockholm Agreement should be implemented. The peace process between Israel and Palestine should be reignited. The zone of peace and stability, an economic boom enjoyed by the Gulf countries could be utilized to stimulate the environment of peace across the Middle East and perhaps begin a grand debate about the future of the Middle East. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of South Africa for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And first of all, I would like to commend Your Excellency and your delegation 
the delegation of Poland uh, for organizing this uh, important debate uh, of the Council with focus on peace in the Middle East. And also, like others, to welcome His Excellency Secretary of State Michael Pompeo, as well as His Excellency Andreas Michaelis, uh, State Secretary uh, of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. And also to thank uh, the chef of the cabinet, uh, my old friend, um, uh, Her Excellency Maria Luisa Fiotti, for her briefing, which I think provided an insight on what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, Mr. President, allow me to make uh, the following points. First, uh, multilateralism should be our guiding principle to bring a lasting peace and security in the region. Any efforts that they feed from or even, or even contradicting this path would only complicate our joint attempt to arrive at a lasting solution. We thus need to reinvigorate the spirit of multilateralism based on the rule of law and the charter of the United Nations. All parties, including those trying to mediate conflict, must ensure respect to international laws and the principle of multilateralism. This is neither favor to anyone nor disfavor to others. For Indonesia, this is central because no matter how grand any proposal is, everything will be in vain unless guided by the commitment to multilateralism and international laws. Second, the importance of investing for peace in the region. Peace is not something we can take for granted. It is something that we have to invest. Our concept of peace goes beyond the absence of war. Co community empowerment, development, education, human rights and democracy, as well as addressing the threat of terrorism, should be part and parcel of the picture. We should also address the massive humanitarian problems confronting millions of refugees and internally displaced persons who are in need of prompt and adequate attention. Saving human life should be the focus of our action in this Council. I'm glad that today we have agreed upon and adopted the Presidential Statement on International Humanitarian Law in your Presidency, Mr. President. Investing in peace also means strengthening the capacities of the affected communities to cope with their situation. In the context of the Security Council, investing for peace in the region should also be displayed through our collective ac actions in addressing various root causes of the challenges faced by the region. But it can only be done if members of the Council are willing to put aside their differences or at least narrowing the gap of disagreement. Indonesia will continue to be actively involved in this endeavor to narrow gaps and find solutions. Third, the Palestinian question at, at the heart of the problem. Despite the plethora of conflicts in the Middle East, let's not forget that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the core issue that intertwines them all, with implication for other issues beyond the region. While we may and for years have had responses to the situation in such places as Yemen, Libya, Syria, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the one with the immense ramification to the cycle of violence and mistrust in those other scenarios. It is a long-term conflict that leads toward long-term instability. To that end, Indonesia reiterates that we must go back to the root causes of the spaghetti web of issues. For us, an ecosystem of peace, stability, and prosperity in the region is almost unthinkable or un unattainable before Palestinians gain the right to independence on the basis of the pre-1967 lines. Our position on this issue is very clear and have been voiced in different of occasion at the Council. Mr. President, in closing, let me remind that violence and atrocities humanitarian condition in these areas of conflict come down to the ability and willingness of this Council to function. This is our political challenge and moral obligation. Let us avoid the temptation to ignore the blood of other people's children. Let us avoid the character of an institu institution which is willing to issue proclamation and presidential statement and resolution just because they are convenient. The challenge of peace everywhere on earth is in our hands. That holds particularly true for places such as the Middle East, where conflict often led to greater bloodshed and mutating into more conflicts. The more we delay in taking action to find peace in the Middle East, 
the more complex, fragile, and dangerous the situation will be. We'll be we will be falling into the quicksand of conflict and one day find out that there are no more air to breathe. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Indonesia for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Equatorial Guinea. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Mr. President. Excellency Minister for Foreign Affairs, once again, I would like to welcome you to our meeting and express to you our admiration and our praise for your high level of participation in the work of the presidency of your country in the Council. And through you, I would also like to thank Poland for having included this important debate on the program of work for the month of August, which coincides with a critical time for the peoples of the Middle East. Equally, my delegation would like to thank the team represented by the chef de cabinet of the Secretary General, Madame Maria Luisa Ribeiro Viotti, for the very detailed briefing that she has just given us. We welcome to the meeting His Excellency Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State of the United States, and Andreas Michaelis, State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Today's meeting, Mr. President, is a great opportunity for this Council to be able to address in an in-depth, comprehensive and objective way the threats to peace and security in the Middle East. Since the last century, there have not been acceptable levels of peace in that area, particularly not now when we see an increase in ethnic, cultural, religious, economic and ideological tensions leading to open military conflicts and terrorist activities which are ever more frequent. The intensification and persistence of these internal conflicts as well as the sectarian violence polarize the countries throughout the region. In general, we see that very many of these conflicts are interlinked and we run the, run the risk of them becoming regionalized and consequences could reach other regions and we could see humanitarian crises. We are seeing unprecedented flows of migrants and refugees, smuggling and trafficking in persons, illicit tra arms trafficking and asymmetric threats which undermine security. In addition to this, as if this situation weren't alarming enough, Equatorial Guinea is particularly worried by certain statements and decisions with regard to recent unexpected developments in the Persian Gulf and the surrounding region, which have a great capacity to generate high-risk tumult and lead, are leading to further nervousness and uncertainty in the Middle East, thus endangering the huge commercial trade which distinguishes the region, which for many years has been contributing not just to the development of the coastal populations, but also to, the prog to progress in very many other parts of the world. Mr. President, in the light of all of these concerns, my delegation, first of all, would like to underscore the overwhelming necessity for there to be a joint global strategy, the main aim of which will be to create a climate of trust between the various peoples of the region. In order to do this, and bearing in mind that the same ethnic and religious families cohabit in very many countries of the Middle East, it is important that the politicians of these states show leadership. They must conduct policies of national cohesion designed to harmonize and normalize the coexistence of these religions and cultures. To achieve this goal, if this goal is achieved, there will not only be a better exist coexistence of peoples in the Middle East, but this will also improve relations between the states in the region. And also, for any process of peace and stabilization in the Middle East, it is important that the United Nations play its role, be that through the Security Council or through the good offices of the Secretary General. The Council, as the principal organ for the promotion and maintenance of international peace and security, 
has a fundamental role to play when it comes to facilitating and supporting genuine and broad-based efforts in order to prevent and resolve violence, as well as to create and maintain initiatives for lasting peace in the region. In this regard, Mr. President, it's important that we have unity amongst all the members of the Council on these fundamental issues. And because of their closeness to the situation and their understanding of their environment, regional and sub-regional organizations are also able to support the work of the United Nations with regard to preventive diplomacy, mediation and trust building. With regard to the ongoing conflicts and wars, we are aware that in order to bring about a just and lasting solution to the Palestinian question on the basis of relevant resolutions of the United Nations and the agreements signed in the past, it continues to be a maximum priority and a necessary condition uh, for achieving peace and security in the region. When it comes to this conflict, it has always been necessary for there to be sincere and just cooperation uh, of the countries that have a special influence in the area. In the light of all this, we've seen how the wars in Syria, Yemen and other parts of the world have caused havoc for the civilian population, including women and children. Millions of them today are refugees, and they are becoming an enormous burden for the host countries, and we would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to those countries for the welcoming spirit. What is needed in these conflicts and disputes is a political solution that will put an end to human suffering and provide for a dignified environment which will facilitate the return of these peoples to their respective countries. For all of these reasons... We would recall the importance of respecting international law, in particular international humanitarian law and human rights, with regard to conflicts that are ongoing, also to combat terrorism, which continues to proliferate uh, due to the destabilization of state institutions. In conclusion, Mr. President, I would like to express our concern about the policies of regime change, interventionism and interference in the internal affairs of other states, which in certain cases have been used as political instruments that have led to changes in governments, have weakened institutions leading to the lack of effective border control and which has made it possible for the chaos that we see in certain countries to be created as we see today in Libya, the effects of which are now being felt dramatically in Western and Central Africa. Thank you. I thank the representative of uh, Equatorial Guinea for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you, Mr. President. My delegation welcomes the convening of this important meeting on challenges to peace and security in the Middle East. We welcome the attendance of various parties in this debate. We thank Madam Maria Luisa Ribeiro Violti, Chef de Cabinet of the Secretary General of the, of the Executive Office of the Secretary General of the United Nations, and we welcome the presence among us of uh, Mr. Mike Pompeo, U.S. Secretary of State, and um, Mr. Andreas Michaeli, State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Mr. President, the challenges related to peace and security which countries in the Middle East are encountering have always been the focus of our Council. Indeed, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the crises in Syria and Yemen, and the Iranian nuclear issue continue to dominate the bulk of our proceedings. These conflicts, owing to the multifaceted threats which they spawn and the challenges they create, require us to seek innovative solutions through concerted action on the part of the United Nations and regional organizations, and also requires stepped-up regional cooperation. Sir, the consideration of the situation in the Middle East leads uh, to a uh, showing of the lack of political prospects, lack of, uh, a of a democratic governance, and 
heightened geopolitical and religious uh, tensions as well as humanitarian tragedies endured by the people there. This grim picture, uh, to put it mildly, is compounded by the grave threat to, to peace and security as posed by the emergence of peripheral and non-state actors, specifically armed groups, to end terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State in uh, the Levant as well, the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. Given this alarming situation, we advocate dialogue. This is the best way to build mutual trust and to forge the necessary trust uh, to arrive at a holistic settlement to these crises. For this reason, we appeal to all stakeholders, to the conflicts in the Middle East, to all parties, to firmly engage in constructive negotiations with the support of regional, sub-regional, and multilateral actors. This to forge the foundations of a lasting peace. There is a proverb that war will never generate enough wealth to purchase peace, and dialogue is the weapon of the strong, not of the weak. However, the only way to achieve success is for negotiations to be inclusive, for them to account for all of the issues that are of concern to the area. A dialogue between cultures and religions, the rights of minorities, the participation of women and young people in peace and development processes. Mr. President, turning to the Iranian nuclear dossier, our country reaffirms our position whereby the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action adopted on 14 July 2015 is a robust guarantee to ensure implementation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as well as to arrive at regional and global peace and security. As a result, we invite all stakeholders to embrace dialogue under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action to deliver on peace and security in the Middle East. In the same vein, we remain convinced that the recent unfortunate uh, circumstances that have arisen in the, Strait of, in the Strait of Hormuz can only be uh, settled through good faith inclusive dialogue. Turning to the Palestinian conflict, we appeal to all protagonists to abandon violence and unilateral initiatives, for them to embrace the solution of two states coexisting in peace in and security under 1967 borders uh, in line with Security Council resolutions. Turning to the Syrian conflict, my delegation wishes to reiterate its support for the efforts of Mr. Geir Peterson, Special Envoy of the Secretary General. We call upon the parties to advance political dialogue, to promote this dialogue, and to endeavor to establish a constitutional committee in line with the relevant provisions of Security Council Resolution 2254. Lastly, vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Yemen, we wish to invite the various stakeholders to fully implement the December 2018 Stockholm Agreement to end hostilities and to assiduously seek to arrive at a political settlement following the course that has been charted by Mr. Griffith, Special Envoy of the Secretary General, as has been reflected in our Council's proceedings this morning. We wish, however, to note with regret, Mr. President, that there is a lack of unity within the Security Council on this issue, and this makes our action ineffective at a time when civilians are facing extreme humanitarian difficulties and uh, there are violations of human rights and international humanitarian rights. These are a daily reality plaguing the region. Hence, we call for the establishment of a strategic partnership between the United Nations and regional organizations, specifically the League of Arab States, uh, to prevent and to peacefully settle disputes in the Middle East. Thank you. I thank the representative of Cote d'Ivoire for his statement. I wish to remind all speakers to limit their statements to no more than four minutes in order to enable the Council to carry out its work expeditiously. Delegations with lengthy statement are kindly requested to circulate the text in writing and to deliver a condensed version when speaking in the chamber. Now I give the floor to the representative of Bahrain. Thank you.
Mr. President, at the outset, I wish to thank you. Uh, thank you and the Polish delegation for having convened this meeting on threats to a peace and security in the Middle East. I also wish to welcome uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, as well as the State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. I welcome Maria Luisa Ribeiro Viotti, Chef de Cabinet, Executive Office of the Secretary General, for her briefing. His Excellency Hamad Baisa Al Khalifa, King of Bahrain, has affirmed that peace and stability throughout the world are based on the free flow of trade. Security is uh, certainly based on what takes place in that region. Sir, the challenges which the region has been encountering are complicated and they are deep-rooted. And these are liable to change the region for many decades to come. Hence, it is incumbent upon us as the international community to undertake all necessary efforts to guarantee stability in the region in a manner that aligns with the principles of good neighborliness, mutual respect, non-intervention in internal affairs of states. This to avoid long-term destabilization in that part of the world. The Kingdom of Bahrain is persuaded of the fact that achievement of a lasting peace and achievement of lasting development in the region, that this is a shared responsibility and it is necessary for us to arrive at uh, shared mechanisms for the Middle East in cooperation with allied states. This is key to achieve peace and security for states and for peoples as well as to cast aside all of those who attempt to destabilize the region, which is encountering many challenges, challenges including terrorism. One of the most significant challenges which our region has to face is the disastrous consequences stemming from terrorism. This is a scourge, a destructive scourge that claims lives, destroys infrastructure, imperils the stability and security of states. It prompts us to reiterate our firm, emphatic condemnation of this phenomenon, regardless of the perpetrators, regardless of the reasons. We also reaffirm the need to counter extremist thinking of terrorist groups and the need to dry up their sources of financing. In this regard, I wish to recall the 11th meeting of the group responsible to combat Daesh. This was held in Bahrain from 16 to 17 April 2019, international efforts have been undertaken to assiduously, assiduously counter Daesh. These efforts were under discussion during this event. The capacity of this uh, group uh, to stage attacks has significantly been downgraded. This progress requires us to persevere in our efforts to combat this group and similar groups to eradicate them, as well as to end the financing and the funds which reach them. The transfer of funds to these groups outside of the global monetary system represents one of the greatest challenges which we face. At a time when Daesh, Hezbollah, and Al Qaeda have been using these funds in an illegal way, the Kingdom of Bahrain reaffirms its position in principle vis a vis the Palestinian question and the rights of the Palestinian people to create their state within the 4 June 1967 borders with. Jerusalem as the capital on the basis of the two-state solution, the Arab Peace Initiative, and a resolutions and international law. On the basis of the conviction that there is a need to provide for a promising economic future for the Palestinian people, in conjunction with the United States of America, we have organized a meeting from 25 to 26 June. During this meeting, there was an exchange of ideas to 
uh, provide for a prosperous future for the Palestinian people. Mr. President, uh, the uh, Putschist militia supported by Iran continue to, uh, uh, to engage initiatives against the government of Yemen, and they continue to threaten the security of the brotherly uh, kingdom. In this regard, we condemn the attack perpetrated against the Sheba oil field. This was targeted by the Houthis in a cowardly act which constitutes a grave threat and attack against the oil reserves of the region. We support and extend our solidarity to the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia in the measures that it has been undertaking to defend the interests. As part of our policy and our initiatives based upon proactive participation to arrive at peace under the framework of cooperation with our international partners, our allies, and our brethren. On the 31st July 2019, we held an important military level meeting on the situation prevailing in the region as well as the ways to step up cooperation and coordination to tackle repeated acts of aggression and the practices which we reject seeking to undermine maritime security in the Gulf area and the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which imperil stability in the region and the world. The Kingdom of Bahrain shall host a meeting on maritime and air security later this year, this in conjunction with the United States of America and Poland. We reaffirm the fact that this initiative dovetails with the role played by the Kingdom in uh, contributing to establishing security and stability within the region as well as to counter the threats faced by the region as a result of Iranian practices which represent a grave danger on maritime routes, navigation, and air routes. To conclude, we reaffirm the fact that uh, national international uh, security requires that we all work hand in hand, that we forge innovative mechanisms to tackle challenges. We shall continue to work alongside the international community to settle conflict in a peaceful manner, as well as uh, to deliver on peace and security in the region and the world. Thank you. Thank the representative of Bahrain for his statement. And now I give the floor to the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic, please. Shukran. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, you on uh, your presidency of the Security Council for the current month. Our delegation has reviewed uh, the concept paper that you have distributed in preparation for this session, and we hold you for the initiative to convene it. As usual, and as, has we've, as we've witnessed in many previous uh, sessions, some member states in this Council have intentionally derailed the uh, debate from its objective, i.e. the diagnosis and treatment of uh, the root causes of the challenges that uh, confront the achievement of peace and security in the Middle East. In other words, they aim to, they aim to obstruct uh, the uh, identification of uh, the causes uh, of uh, these challenges, i.e. occupation and aggression and destructive external intervention in the affairs of the country, countries of the region in different forms, including those that aim to forcibly overthrow systems of government and invest uh, in terrorism instead of investing uh, in peace, as my friend uh, from Indonesia has uh, said rightly. These, uh, inter um, these causes include uh, the fabrication uh, of uh, crises uh, and prolonging these crises and dragging the entire country into uh, the entire region into bloody wars uh, that waste their wealth uh, and uh, undermine uh, the prosperity and security of their people. The Middle East uh, and uh, from the beginning of the 20th century until today has witnessed terrible tragedies because uh, of uh, the uh, the colonial state's uh, preference of their own narrow interests uh, and uh, their desires over the 
principles of peace and justice and law. Therefore, the successful treatment of these challenges requires upholding international law and the Charter, which is the common denominator. These attempts, these countries must stop their attempts to distort the Charter and to manipulate its its provisions uh, and the challenges uh, that the Middle East is uh, facing occupy a large portion of the Security Council's agenda ever since the United Nations was founded. These are, uh, challenges are regional, however, they preoccupy the minds of everyone in the world. Therefore, treating them seriously and according to the law is not simply a regional interest, rather it, these, it is in the interest of the entire world. And here I would like to stress the following. Number one. Any objective look at the reason for tension in the Middle East must emanate from a concession that the main reason for this conflict and the main reason that there is no peace and stability has and always will be the Israeli occupation of Arab territory, including the occupied Syrian Golan. This is not due to any factors that are racial or religious or sectarian. These are fabricated reasons that are being peddled by some in order to fragment the countries of the region and redraw their borders and to weaken the resilience of our peoples in the face of Israeli bullying. The absence of the necessary mechanisms to enforce the implementation of your own council's resolutions on the Arab-Israeli conflict, this absence has led to the continuation of the occupation and has enabled the occupation to continue its crimes against our people in the occupied Arab territories. It has encouraged the U.S. administration to attempt to evade its obligations in accordance with the resolutions of your council. And this is manifest in the uh, U.S. president's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and what he called Israeli sovereignty on the occupied Syrian Golan, and the attempt to pass off a suspicious deal that is tantamount to the crime of the century. Moreover, this has encouraged the special coordinator for the Middle East, Nikolai Madanov, to continue to not perform his mandated duties, as we have repeatedly pointed out. Anyone who questions the existence of an organic link between what is happening in our region, on the one hand, and between the quest to entrench and prolong the Israeli occupation of Arab territories and the Syrian Golan is delusional or misinformed or naive. Number two, the United Nations was founded on the principles of the sovereign equality of states and non-intervention in the internal affairs of states. Moreover, it was founded on the principle of the non-use of force or the threat of the use of force. Respecting these uh, high principles requires, among other things, binding the United Na States and its allies, including the Turkish occupation forces, binding them to ending their illegal military presence on my country's territories and obliging them to stop their pro-terrorism aggression and their crimes against Syrians and civilian installations and infrastructure. You have, noted, you have witnessed how Erdogan's regime has brought in mercenaries and terrorists who are Uzbeks, Tajiks, Caucasians, Igors, and Turks, and other Arabs and Europeans across the Turkish borders with Syria into Idlib to support the terrorist Jabhat al-Nusra organization and other terrorist organizations that are allied to it. It has also brought in machinery laden with weapons and ammunition to support these terrorists. Moreover, some have colluded to the point of calling these foreign terrorists as with the label of the moderate armed Syrian opposition. Number three, we call for the immediate and unconditional lifting of the coercive unilateral measures that the United Nations have consistently uh, declared illegitimate and which have a devastating impact on the peoples of the region and their ability to achieve development and has prompted the citizens of these countries to leave their homelands uh, as uh, refugees and as immigrants. And these coercive measures is a for, are a form of economic terrorism that comes to continue the terrorism of terrorist organizations. It is an expression of the hypocrisy of starving people and depriving them of their basic necessities of life while proclaiming concern for the welfare of the Syrian people and concern for the achievement of the 2030 development agenda so that nobody is left behind. Number four, we must deal firmly with the threat posed by Israel's arsenal of weapons of mass destruction. And we must bind Israel to join the NPT as a non-nuclear state and to place all of its activities and installations under the IAEA safeguard system in accordance with 
Security Council Resolution 487 of the year 1981. Here, we would like to renew our call for adopting the Syrian initiative that aims to establish a zone free of all weapons of mass destruction with nuclear weapons at the forefront in the Middle East. The draft resolution for this initiative, which was submitted by my state during its membership in the Security Council in 2003, this draft resolution continues to be a prisoner in the filing cabinets of this council. As for the situation in the Gulf area, we would like to condemn the policies to fabricate crises and ignite new wars in the region with the aim of distracting the peoples of these regions from their main cause, which is putting an end to the Israeli occupation and confronting attempts to impose hegemony and to plunder the wealth of this region. Prevent, if we fail to prevent this, we would witness new wars where the people of our region are the main victims. And the repercussions will not be limited to the Middle East, but will spread outwards. In closing, the time has gone for the peoples of our region to live as others in the world, in prosperity and in safety and stability, and to reclaim their role in enriching human civilization whose cradle was in the Middle East, and to establish the values of peace and coexistence between peoples and civilizations and cultures. And this requires your council to adopt a serious and effective approach to deal with the reasons of this instability that I have just mentioned away from a policy of selectivity and double standards, which has been the main feature of the Security Council's dealing with issues of our region, which is mistakenly named the Middle East. I thank you. Thank the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic for his statement. And now I give the floor to the representative of Turkey. Thank you. Madam President, thank you for organizing this timely meeting on a team that is of paramount importance to the maintenance of international peace and security. For centuries, the peoples of the Middle East and North Africa lived together in peace and harmony, regardless of their race, religion, language, sect, or ethnicity. They did so and flourished politically, economically, socially, and intellectually with a sense of shared destiny, embracing at the same time their differences as a source of richness. Today's, today's reality differs dramatically from that historical background, and the region is confronted with ever-growing complex challenges. Sectarian and divisive policies, brutal oppression of legitimate demands for democracy, unresolved armed conflicts resulting in mass displacements, coupled with feelings of resentment due to growing discrimination, have created a breeding ground for relapse into violence. Madam President, today the main challenge in the region remains to keep the prospects for the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict alive. It is regrettable that the vision of a two-state solution, which is the only feasible path to resolve this long-standing issue, has been deliberately weakened due to unilateral and illegal practices in the occupied Palestinian territories. Any peace plan for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should endorse an independent, sovereign, contiguous and viable Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, living side by side with Israel in peace and security. There is no other alternative to a viable peace. As per Syria, in addition to the horrific crimes of Assad's brutal regime in the form of this indiscriminate airstrikes, barrel bombs, chemical weapons, and artillery shelling, and as recently repeated in Idlib, deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure there are other menaces facing the civilian population in Syria, such as the well-documented crimes of the terrorist organizations such as Daesh, Al-Qaeda, and other affiliated groups, as well as PKK and the Syrian brand PYD-YPG. Let us not forget that only a political solution based on Resolution 2254 can end the Syrian civil war. Madam President, in this context, I would also like to refer to the hallucinatory remarks of the Syrian regime represented from my country. And I will repeat, I do not consider him as my legitimate counterpart. His presence here is an affront to the millions of Syrians who suffered countless crimes at the hands of this regime, and therefore I will not honor his delusional accusations with a response. Madam President, we are also deeply worried about the deteriorating situation in Yemen. 
We call upon all parties in Yemen to refrain from further deepening the political and humanitarian crisis in the country. There can be no military solution in Yemen. Inclusive political dialogue is the only way to establish peace and security in the country. Turkey will continue to support international efforts aimed at promoting the security and stability of Yemen, as well as protecting the unity and integrity of the country. We also see no military solution in Libya. Peace and stability in Libya can only be achieved through political dialogue and compromise. Regional and international actors have a crucial role to play in ending the conflict and paving the way to peace and stability in Libya. The divisions within the international community make it impossible for the Council to assume its most needed role. There is an urgent need to return to the UN-facilitated political process. In concluding, Madam President, the international community and first and foremost this Council should play a more constructive and assertive role in resolving the conflicts in the Middle East. This requires, first of all, respect for the basic principles of international law enshrined in the UN Charter, including respect for political unity and territorial integrity, peaceful resolution of disputes and good neighborly relations. Secondly, members of the international community should respect and implement UN resolutions that pertain to the security and stability of the region, including those on Palestine. This is sine qua non for a basis for mutual understanding. Third, it is essential that the international community avoids approaching the conflicts in the Middle East from a zero-sum perspective. Peace, security, and stability in the Middle East is in our common interest. We are all affected from armed conflicts, wars, and crises in the Middle East, and from the ensuing mistrust, alienation, and radicalization. If peace is to triumph, we should constitute a solid foundation for better dialogue, understanding, cooperation, and collaboration within and with the region. Thank you. I thank the representative of Turkey for his statement. And now I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Silvio Gonzato, Chargé d'Affaires at Interim of the Delegation of the European Union to the United Nations. Thank you. Madam President, members of the Security Council, I have the honor to speak on behalf of the European Union and its member states. The Republic of North Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Liechtenstein align themselves with this statement. Conflict resolution for the Middle East, followed by post-crisis management, <coughs> is one of the most difficult tasks international diplomacy is currently facing. The EU fully support the United Nations, and in particular, the Security Council as the key actor for upholding respect for and compliance with international law, such as the UN United Nations Security Council resolutions relevant to the situation in the Middle East. Only if all sides comply with their obligations under international law, including adherence to all resolutions of the Security Council, can a credible peace take root. Otherwise, sustainable peace is at stake. A key challenge to peace and security in the Middle East is terrorism, fueled by radicalization and violent extremism. Even if Daesh has been territorially defeated in Syria and Iraq, it continues to pose a serious threat. Terrorist threats also exist elsewhere, including in Yemen and Gaza. In fact, while there is a concentration of such activity in this region, terrorism can strike in all parts of the world. Another element to consider is the lack of trust among key parties and the absence of a political horizon for many citizens. Many countries in the Middle East are witnessing an erosion of social contracts, contracts which is posing serious strains on social cohesion and territorial integrity. This has led to a fragmentation of society and the multiplication of subnational armed forces and armed actors with narrow interests. Without trusts and inclusiveness, no political solution can be successful. Madam President, let me explain how we see all these factors in relation to the situation across the Middle East. The EU is extremely concerned by the measures taken by Iran since the beginning of July, inconsistent with its nuclear-related commitments under the JCPOA. We call upon Iran to reverse these steps immediately, to refrain from any further escalatory steps and to come back into compliance with its obligations. 
We recall our firm commitments under the agreement, including as regards sanction liftings for the benefit of the Iranian people. In this regard, we regret the reimposition of sanctions by the United States following its withdrawal from the JCPOA. Our support for the JCPOA, endorsed unanimously by UN Security Council Resolution 2231, goes hand in hand with our efforts to promote stability in the region. We remain committed to the preservation and full implementation of the JCPOA, a key element of the global nuclear non-proliferation regime, which is in the security interest of all. And we are determined to work with the international community to achieve these goals. We're also gravely concerned by Iran's ballistic missile activity and transfer of missiles and relevant technologies to state and non-state actors in the region. We call upon Iran to refrain from any activity inconsistent with relevant UN Sec Security Council resolutions. The EU supports a balanced, comprehensive approach with Iran, including dialogue with a view to addressing all issues of concern, critical when there are div divergences and cooperative when there, are, when there is mutual interest. We are determined to continue pursuing efforts to enable the continuation of legitimate trade with Iran, through including, including through the initiative by France, Germany, and the United Kingdom to operationalize the special purpose ve vehicle INSTEX, which is, which is registered as a private entity and which will support European economic operators engaged in legitimate trade with Iran in accordance with the EU law and with UN Security Council Resolution 2231. The freedom and security of maritime navigation in the Gulf is currently at stake. The European Union always supports the freedom of navigation, which is essential to all our economies. Everybody must fully respect international law, including notably the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, that is rightly recognized widely as the constitution of the oceans, reflecting customary international law. The EU has called upon all actors in, in the Gulf region to exercise restraint. Prompt the escalation is necessary to minimize the risk of miscalculation, which still remains high. Also with respect to Iran, the escalation and restraint are of fundamental importance. In recent high-level meetings in Iran, in Kuwait, and other countries in the region, we underlined our concerns about the prevailing situation, and in turn, our partners have expressed their own determination to work to promote calm and stability. The EU continues to insist on the full respect of international humanitarian law and human rights law in Yemen. This includes respecting and protecting civilian lives, as well as respecting the work of humanitarian aid workers. Furthermore, the U European Union remains fully committed to the unity, sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Yemen. The EU urges all parties to cease violence and to engage in dialogue immediately, in particular by fulfilling their commitments to the UN-led process in an inclusive and sustainable political process. The same must be said about of the Syrian conflict and the protracted violent repression against the civilian population in Syria that has continued to take innocent lives for well over eight years. Successive ceasefire agreements have been violated the EU has repeatedly expressed its great concerns about the escalation of violence in Idlib, caused primar primarily by the Syrian regime and Russia, and which threatens the safety and security of three million people. The EU reiterates its call for a double ceasefire, durable ceasefire to be ensured in the terms agreed upon in the Sochi Memorandum, as well as the need to ensure unhindered, safe and sustainable humanitarian access. The EU insists that there can be no military solution and that only a political solution in line with United Nations Security Council Resolution 2254 can bring sustainable peace and stability. The EU fully supports the work of the UN Special Envoy, including efforts towards the creation of a balanced and inclusive constitutional committee that would allow progress in the intra-Syrian talks in Geneva for a credible, negotiated, Syrian-owned political solution to the conflict. The European Union stresses that, in view of finding sustainable solutions, it is also key to pave the way for free and fair elections, to support Syrian civil society, including women and their equitable and meaningful engagement in the political process, and to identify confidence-building measures between parties to the conflict, including on the issue of detainees and missing persons. 
The EU is ready to assist in the reconstruction of Syria only when a comprehensive, genuine and inclusive political transition negotiated by the Syrian parties in the conflict on the basis of UN Security Council Resolution 2254 and the 2012 Geneva Communique is firmly underway. The European Union considers accountability and justice as prerequisites for sustainable peace in the region. And given the lack of jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, we'll continue to support the work of the III mechanism and the Independent Commission of Inquiry. We will continue to provide funding for the OP OPCW in order to identify and hold accountable the perpetrators of chemical attacks in, in Syria. The promotion of accountability and justice is a key element of reconciliation in the post-crisis management, not just in Syria, but also in Iraq, where we support the evidence gathered by uh, being carried out, the evidence gathering work being carried out by UNITAD. With regard to the Middle East peace process, let me begin by reaffirming the EU's commitment to a just and comprehensive resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through a two-state solution and an agreement that ends the occupation which began in 1967, ending all claims and fulfilling the aspirations of both parties, including Israeli and Palestinian security needs and Palestinian aspirations for statehood and sovereignty on the basis of relevant UN Security Council resolutions and international agreed parameters. The EU's firm and united position on these resolutions and parameters has been set out in, details, in detail on numerous occasions. We reaffirm our readiness to work with both parties and our partners in the region and the international community towards the resumption of mini meaningful negotiations to resolve all final status issues and to achieve a just and lasting peace. Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are illegal under international law and constitute a significant obstacle to peace, as reaffirmed in UN Security Council Resolution 2334. The ongoing Israeli settlement policy threatens the prospects for a two-state solution. Recent and increasing violence in Gaza, including firing of rockets into Israel and violence in the West Bank, remind us that restoring a political horizon for peace between Israelis and Palestinians is essential to reduce violence and contain extremism in the region. In the light of recent tensions which threatened exacerbating the risk of, to the whole region, the EU recalls the special significance of the holy sites in Jerusalem, a cause for the appalling of the status quo put in place in 1967 for Temple Mount Hal Sharam Hal Sharif, in line with previous understandings and with respect to Jordan's special role. As regards Lebanon, the EU stresses the importance for progress on the structural and economic reform commitments undertaken at the CEDRE conference in Paris, as well as the reforms related to the security sector as pledged at the Rome II meeting in March 2018. Moreover, the EU is a strong supporter of UNIFIL and reiterates the crucial role of UNIFIL in maintaining peace and stability in the south of Lebanon, as well as in the region. As such, the EU emphasizes the importance of UNIFIL being able to deliver its mandate in full. The EU also insists on the full respect and implementation of UN Council's Security Council Resolution 1559 and 1701 by all parties, including the call for the disarmament of all armed groups in Lebanon. On counterterrorism, the European Union maintains its firm commitment to assist and work closely together with our partners in the region. Beside Daesh, the reappearance of, of Al-Qaeda in the region continues to provide fertile ground for violent extremism and radicalization leading to terrorism, as do other terrorist organizations sanctioned by the EU, including Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The regular counterterrorism dialogue with dialogues with our regional partners, including among others Israel, Egypt, and Jordan, provide a framework for enhanced joint effort, efforts aimed at diminishing the terrorist propaganda from the internet, halt the resources of terrorism financing, and ensure due accountability for terrorist atrocities that equal to grave violations of human rights and international humanitarian law, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. We are pleased that the global coalition against Daesh is pursuing these objectives. 
Another key challenge to bring about peace and security in the Middle East is the lack of trust and the need to create conditions for peace amongst the population. Strengthening democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms is an essential strategy in order to build trust between different groups in societies and between the government and its citizens. It is important to act against any form of incitement for hatred and violence, including by using the education system to promote mutual tolerance and peaceful co coexistence. Madam President, this analysis leads to the conclusion that sustainable solutions to the conflicts in the Middle East can only be found through multilateral cooperation, i.e. through policy and actions coordinated by the international community, some of which are translated into international law, in other words, by means of a rules-based international order to which the parties on the ground and international actors shall commit themselves. And let me underline that international law includes international humanitarian law and human rights law. Only a few days ago, we celebrated 70 years of the Geneva Conventions. The EU's support for international law is one of the key building blocks of the Union's common foreign security policy. Our clear policy is in favor of the full implementation of international humanitarian law at all times everywhere, in Syria and in Yemen, and equally in the occupied Palestinian territory. Our commitment to the fight against terrorism and our work with partners on the ground to build confidence exemplify our commitment to the multilateral approach. approach. Many actions have been agreed upon at international multilateral level, of which I mentioned several. Most are UN-led. The EU, for its part, will continue to support peace and security in the Middle East, including through the UN. Lack of implementation of agreed policies and enforcement of international law is the real challenge to bring about peace and security in the Middle East. It has, also, it has almost become fashionable simply not to agree on a course of action and not to follow agreements. Narrow interests often prevail over the international need for compromise and mutual gain. The international community must therefore seek methods to make agreed policies implementable and to ensure full respect for international law. Thank you. I thank Mr. Gonzato for his statement. And now I give the floor to the representative of Saudi Arabia. Shukran, Sayyid Rais. <coughs> thank you, Madam President. I would like to begin by endorsing the uh, statement to be delivered uh, shortly by the United Arab Emirates on behalf of the Arab Group. Uh, I would like to thank you for this initiative to organize this uh, meeting on the maintenance of international peace and security and the challenges that we are facing in the Middle East in those areas. And. Uh, I thank you for the concept note, and that concept note has led us to various considerations and questions. The note refers to the root causes of the conflicts in the Middle East. Some believe that the, these conflicts are ethnic or religious in nature and that go back millennia. Well, in reality, uh, that's not the case at all. And that is particularly true when it comes to the two main entities responsible for the danger in the region, namely Israel and Iran. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict has never been an ethnic or religious conflict. Indeed, the Muslim Arabs have lived with their Jewish and Christian um, uh, counterparts in peace and security throughout the um, Arab Islamic domination in Palestine. That situation only changed when the Sunni movement, a colonialist and racist movement, uh, took control of Palestinian uh, territory and homes at the beginning of the 21st century when Sunni groups such as the Ergon um, engaged in uh, um, ethnic uh, cleansing and made the Palestinians refugees, deprive them of life and dignity and the right to self-determination. So 
there is no revenge between um, Palestinians and Jews in Palestine. That's a question of principle that's recognized by international law and resolutions of the Security Council. The un uh, um, 181, the unjust resolution that created the partition in the first place, uh, as well as 242, 338, uh, 497, 694, 1860, and others, which have reaffirmed the necessity for the creation of a Palestinian state along the 1967 lines with Jerusalem as its capital. The world has recognized the two-state solution, but Israel continues its uh, activities. It refu refuses to recognize the historic rights of the Palestinian people to their territory. Worse still, Israel continues with its provocations. The last of them was the entry into the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the um, ag aggression on the Eid al hadda day, and that is something that we very firmly condemn. Moreover, Others are speaking about a conflict that goes back centuries between uh, Sunnis and Shiites and state that the uh, disagreement with uh, Iran is part of this conflict. That's also incorrect. Although the Shiite, doct although the Shiite doctrine um, uh, has been in certain Arab countries for 1,200 years, it only spread in Iran in the 16th century, um, which made uh, Iran Shiite, but did not make the rest of the world Shiite. That's why to talk about a religious war of going back millennia is uh, an illusion. The uh, Shiites have lived in the Arab world with their brothers and sisters of the Sunni persuasion in cooperation and in peace and in security. The differences with Iran only appeared after the Iranian Revolution, which gave a, a, an overwhelming and preponderant and exclusive role in certain areas to the Shiite population. And they went further than that. They wanted to export the re revolution to the Islamic world. Indeed, the Iranian uh, constitution states that the Constitution opens the way for this revolution um, within Iran and beyond its borders. Recognizing this historic fact is the point of departure in order to maintain peace and security in the Middle East. You, you have to recognize the right of self-determination of the Palestinians for their state. Uh, we must also recognize that the rejection of violence, colonialism, displacement, and destruction of of houses. We must recognize the rights of the people in the region to live in peace uh, without interference in their internal affairs, the right to uh, uh, and, uh, and that, that uh, there cannot be a right to export revolution uh, through Houthis and others. The Security Council must uh, do all it can to reaffirm the principle of peaceful relations between countries. We, there must be a refusal of uh, oppression, violence, sedition, and an incitement to violence, uh, of which Israel and Iran are guilty, uh, destabilizing the, the region. If we recognize these basic principles, then the whole region will be able to um, devote its financial and intellectual and natural resources to cooperate towards the development uh, towards development and prevent the spread of terrorism and uh, it will be able to fight for an occupation a social injustice and marginalization uh, and uh, um, my country reaffirms its, its uh, attachment to international law. We support everything that will ensure peace and stability in the region. Uh, we support development in the region. It is our conviction that global development in the Middle East will make it possible to uh, de-radicalize, uh, to prevent terrorism and calm conflicts. We are prepared to unceasingly cooperate and discuss 
uh, how we can peacefully solve these issues. But we must reaffirm that uh, calls for dialogue must uh, go hand in hand with, a, with um, stopping threats and internal interference um, in, um, diploma in, in, in diplomatic sphere, cyber attacks against infrastructure, for example, the um, uh, proper propaganda, um, militia and terrorist groups and the support given to them. If these pra practices do not cease, then all calls for dialogue uh, are, are simply a smokescreen and will only be serving the expansionist uh, wishes of certain countries. What to the representative of Iraq? Thank you, Madam President. At the outset, we would like to congratulate the Republic of Poland on assuming the presidency of the Council for the month of August, and we thank you for holding this important high-level meeting, and we wish you every success. Madam President, the region is facing deep divides, attempts to destroy its diverse ethnic, racial and cultural fabric, conflicts that lasted for decades, new conflicts, the emergence of terrorism and new forms of violent extremism that undermined peace, sustainable development and human rights. It threatened the safety of countries and their very existence. It has displaced millions of people from their homes, and this has had an effect on the stability in other countries. We must recognize that the main reason for conflicts, racial, ideological, or sectarian in nature, has been the presence of political, economic, and social problems and the spread of hate speech that ignited the flame of conflict that have claimed the lives of millions of innocent people. The region needs stability based on a system of collective security that is also based on respecting sovereignty and the non-interference in internal affairs. The rejection of violence and extremism, our regional security is collective and connected. Madam President, Iraq, with its geopolitical importance, its potential, and its cultural diversity, could help build understandings that strengthen security and political stability in the region. We also believe that any clash in our region will jeopardize the security of Iraq. Therefore, we suggest holding constructive dialogues between countries concerned to diffuse tensions and overcome differences between all parties to avoid further escalation and prevent any other war in our region with negative repercussions for all. Madam President, the government of my country reaffirms that the Israeli occupation is the cause behind tensions in the region. We cannot even imagine stability and security in our region without a solution that gives justice to the Palestinian people and meets their legitimate aspirations to freedom and to establishing an independent state that is viable. We also reaffirm the need for further consultations to reach a political solution that prevents further despair and further acts of violence and extremism in the region and beyond. We must all work on creating the necessary conditions to achieve peace while taking into consideration the specificity of the city, of the holy city of Jerusalem, which must be addressed as part of a comprehensive solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict including the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital as the only means to achieve peace 
stability and security. Madam President, the pillars of security and peace in the region are not only limited to security and political agreements, they also require combating corruption, enhancing the role of women, supporting young people, meeting their aspirations, and addressing the challenges of climate change. Corruption is one of the root causes of political crises and societal divides in countries. It is one of the reasons why conflicts emerge. It is also linked to illicit traffic in weapons, drugs, and violent extremism. Countries must give priority to good governance, combating corruption, and adopting correct and effective policies to combat money laundering and the financing of terrorism. Furthermore, we must support women so that they can hold leadership positions in economic, political, and administrative areas. This is an essential need to achieve sustainable development for our countries within a modern civic state that guarantees the rights and dignity of all. We must also meet the aspirations of young people for a better future so that they do not adopt extremist ideas and join armed groups. Young people must be integrated in their societies. They must be productive citizens. We must advance the level of education and work opportunities so that we can meet their needs, so that they do not destroy their societies. Finally, one of the threats to peace and security, the unequal use of water resources and the spread of desertification. This has had a negative impact on the environment. It has led to displacement within and outside national borders. Therefore, we need clear regional frameworks that regulate the equal and reasonable use of water. In conclusion, in Iraq, we reaffirm that the best way to maintain our regional security is peace and cooperation between the countries of the region against terrorism and extremism so that we can achieve our collective security while respecting the sovereignty of countries and rejecting any internal affairs, any intervention in internal affairs. We must strengthen the ties of friendship and deepen economic and cultural integration. Peace and harmony could help launch the process of sustainable development in our countries. I thank you. I thank the representative of Iraq for his statement. And now I give the floor to the representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Madam President, thank you for convening this meeting. I also thank the distinguished chef de cabinet to the Secretary General for her input. The main and longest conflict in the Middle East is the question of Palestine. As long as it remains un unsolved, peace and security in the Middle East cannot be restored. Unlawful occupation of Palestine is the main cause. Therefore, it can end only by ending the occupation. There is no magic solution. All initiatives so far have disregarded this principle and failed. The so-called deal of the century is bound to fail for the same reason. The land of Palestine is not up for sale, and aspirations, honor and dignity, and inalienable rights of an entire nation cannot be bought. The U.S., through supporting the occupation, has been responsible for prolongation of this conflict. This is the case with respect to almost all other conflicts in the region. One can easily track the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, supporting some terrorist groups, as well as many other unlawful acts, including cyber attacks in the Middle East. Yesterday marked the 66th anniversary of a U.S.-U.K. orchestrated coup against the democratically elected government of Iran. After the Islamic Revolution, instances of U.S. interferences in Iran include supporting Saddam Hussein in his aggression against Iran, 
downing of an Iranian passenger flight and killing all 290 on board, including 66 children, supporting several coup attempts, and its economic terrorism, targeting ordinary and vulnerable Iranians like patients by using food and medicine as a weapon against them. One of the main causes of instability and insecurity of our sensitive region is the military presence by the US who has deployed over 70,000 troops across the Middle East with active military presence in all littoral states of the Persian Gulf except Iran. The number of foreign military installations in the Middle East has increased from four in 1990 to 41 in 2018, almost all of which are US installations the highest concentration of foreign military installations in the world. In addition to illegal withdrawal of, of the United States from the JCPOA, another destabilizing factor in the region is the unbridled flow of American weaponry into this region, which has turned it into a powder cake. Unfortunately, some countries in our region, such as Saudi Arabia, are recipients of this deadly weaponry with the illusion that they can buy security through relying on the United States. In fact, the only beneficiary of this accumulation of weaponry in the region is the defense industry of exporting countries. Likewise, we should not lose sight of the destabilizing nature and impact of the divine and rule strategy of the United States through which it, it has persistently sought division between the regional countries. The Iranophobic statements of the US officials serve also the same purpose. They disseminate fabrications against Iran to justify their policy in the region with the aim of excluding Iran from playing its role in the region. Iran has been in this region for millennia and will remain there for millennia to come. Therefore, any attempt to exclude or bypass Iran from the region is an illusion and doomed to fail. While we are not seeking confrontation, we cannot and will not remain indifferent to the violation of our sovereignty. Therefore, in order to secure our borders and interests, we will vigorously exercise our inherent right to self-defense. As a country with the longest coastlines in the Persian Gulf and the Oman Sea, Iran is determined to continue ensuring the safety and security of maritime navigation in this area, particularly in the Strait of Hormuz. The interference of foreign forces in this strategic waterway under whatever pretext, is destabilizing and thus unacceptable. Any attempt at artificial coalition building for securing navigation in this area will fail. We believe that the literal states are responsible for the security of the Persian Gulf. That is the basis of our initiative to create a regional dialogue forum, which is in line with paragraph eight of Security Council Resolution 598. We continue consultations with our brothers in the region to, allow, to realize such a lofty goal. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Egypt. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, at the outset, I would like to thank Poland for organizing this session to discuss the challenges to peace and security in the Middle East. And we thank you for inviting the countries of the region to participate in this important discussion. Madam President, the Middle East is suffering from many challenges that for decades prevented the people of the region from enjoying peace, security, and stability. These challenges included political, security, and economic challenges. The region has also faced many wars for half a century, and this has depleted the capacity and resources of its peoples. The Arab-Israeli conflict, and at its heart, the Palestinian question, is one of the oldest crises in the region. It was passed on through generations in the region, it prevented our peoples from enjoying security and stability, despite the inherent right of the Palestinian people pursuant to resolutions of international legitimacy to self-determination and the establishment of their country, of their 
independent state along the lines of 1967 with East Jerusalem as its capital. Double standards and the absence of justice continue to plague the Palestinian cause to this very day, and they constitute one of the reasons behind the absence of security and stability in the region, while the Palestinian people continues to suffer from the ex exploitation of some to achieve narrow interests. Despite numerous initiatives and rounds of negotiations to achieve comprehensive peace in the region, we believe it is necessary to re-operationalize the Arab Peace Initiative and its principles to achieve peace in the region in a way that guarantees the rights of all parties and addresses their concerns for a better future for future generations. Madam President, the Middle East has also suffered for years from challenges that threatened the concept of a national state and the attempts of some to promote sectarian references to destroy the principle of citizenship and a national sovereign state. They have also tried to destroy other firm principles in international law and the Charter of the United Nations. This has increased the suffering of the people in the region. It has led to the spread of armed conflicts, the spread of terrorist groups and illicit armed groups. In this regard, I would like to refer to common traits and root causes for conflicts in the region, despite the specificity of every case. We are committed to meeting the legitimate aspirations of the peoples of these countries for a decent life, for achieving peace and stability and social justice. However, we reaffirm that the only way to achieve that goal is to reform and maintain a national state and not by destroying a nas the national state and creating chaos under any pretense. Madam President, achieving security and stability in the Middle East will only be achieved by adhering to the principles of the, United, of the Charter of the United Nations, by ending foreign interferences, by respecting the principles of good neighborliness, by non-interfering in the internal affairs of countries, by putting an end to igniting any sectarian tensions that will lead to further tensions and unrest at a time when the region desperately needs security and stability. When addressing achieving security and stability in the region, I cannot but reaffirm the necessity to take a serious stance against countries that provided financing to terrorism, training and safe haven to terrorists, and that turned terrorists to a tool to interfere in countries in the region and to achieve their regional goals, which furthered the suffering and the bloodshed of innocence. innocence. It had threatened security. It runs counter to international conventions, and we must take a serious stance against these countries. One of the pillars to achieve stability in the region, creating a Middle East that is free from weapons of mass destruction, implementing relevant international obligations, including the resolution of the Review Conference of Non-Proliferation of 1995 and Security Council resolutions 487 and 687. In this regard, we look forward to the support of all parties concerned to create for the conference to the support of all parties in the conference to create a Middle East that is free from weapons of mass destructions, which will hold its first session during November under the presidency of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And we urge countries invited to the conference to participate in goodwill so that we can begin to draft a security system that addresses the concerns, the security concerns of all. We look forward to making serious efforts to enable the Security Council and the United Nations to carry out their responsibilities to achieve security and peace in the Middle East and to address political problems and crises that plague our region pursuant to resolutions of international legitimacy, principles of the Charter and international law. We 
reaffirm our we are ready to continue to make every effort to achieve this goal. I thank you. ...of Egypt for his statement. And now I give the floor to the representative of Israel. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank Poland for initiating this important meeting. Before I begin, I want to take a minute to highlight the terror attacks that took place over the weekend, which symbolized the real threats to peace and security in the region. On Thursday, two young Palestinians armed with knives suddenly begin attacking police officers in Jerusalem. You can look it online on YouTube and you will see those horrible pictures. The young boys were incited and attacked policemen. Then on Friday, a Palestinian drove his car into two young Israeli adults as they waited at a bus stop. And on Saturday evening, the IDF stopped three armed terrorists from breaching the Gaza security fence and attacking nearby civilian communities. All this in a matter of a few days. In addition, Hamas, an internationally recognized terrorist organization, continues to hold hostage two Israeli civilians and the abducted bodies of two fallen Israeli soldiers and refuses to return them home. They also refuse to allow International Committee of the Red Cross visits and to provide information about their fate or conditions. The families of Lieutenant Hadar Goldin, Sergeant Oron Shaul, Avera Mangisto, and Aisham Al Sayyad deserve to be reunited with their loved ones. The international community cannot continue to stand idly by as this evil ploy persists. The State of Israel will not rest until all of our citizens are returned to our land. Madam President, we live in a historic age. 70 years ago, the world bore witness to the greatest story in generations, the re-establishment of the Jewish state in the land of Israel. This rebirth did not begin a new story. Instead, it was just the newest chapter in the continuing saga of the Jewish people in the Middle East. 40 years ago, history was made yet again when a handshake between Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Prime Minister Menachem Begin demonstrated to the world that Egypt recognizes the legitimacy of the Jewish state in the Middle East and proving to the entire Arab world how we can all live together in peace and security. Today, an unprecedented wave of normalization is sweeping the region as Israel continues to develop and improve relations with our Arab neighbors. In June, Bahraini Foreign Minister Khalid bin Ahmad El Khalifa declared, and I quote, Israel is part of the heritage of this whole region. Historically, the Jewish people have a place among us. This is an extraordinary statement. The Foreign Minister's words affirm what is self-evidently true that the Jews are a part of this region's past, present, and future, and that we have a right to sovereignty. This is what sets the foundation for blossoming relations. However, as I sit here today, the Palestinian leadership has yet to recognize this historic right. On the contrary, they keep denying the Jewish historical connection to the land of Israel and our right to sovereignty. It is clear that the Palestinian leadership is trying to prevent the normalization of relations within the Middle East, which can unlock the great potential of this region. This afternoon, I direct my remarks to the Palestinian and to all the Arab people around the region directly. Heed my message, Israel is not your enemy. Madam President, in the 1990s, we had the growing prospect of regional peace and stability. In the climate of the renewed negotiations, Israel and Jordan reached another historic peace agreement. Now, nearly three decades later, Israel and our Arab neighbors find ourselves in a similar environment. We have very good relations with many countries in our region. More than that, Israel and our Arab neighbors share a mutual understanding of the region's threats and opportunities. 
we are deeply involved in confronting extremism and terrorism across the Middle East. Yet, the climate of today's relationship building is different in one large respect. Looming over us is a dark cloud is the threat posed by the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Islamic Republic's blatant pursuit of nuclear weapons for militant purposes in violation of the JCPOA should indicate to everyone in this room that this regime does not want nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Iran's ballistic missile arsenal, the largest in the Middle East, violates numerous Security Council resolutions. Just last month, the Islamic Republic test-fired a medium-range missile over 1,000 kilometers. Look at the map. Think where they can reach. And as previously fired missiles adorned with Israel must be wiped out in bold letters on its side, in Hebrew. The regime's support for terrorism has a global reach and is widely documented. Iran contributes over $7 billion annually to terror groups. Just two weeks ago, the Islamic Republic announced that they were increasing their financial backing of Hamas from $6 million to $30 million a month. The support of Hezbollah has contributed to the destabilization of Lebanon, and their involvement in Syria has continued to fuel the horrific civil war which has led hundreds of thousands of casualties. This malicious behavior serves only one purpose, to export the Iranian revolution. Yet, Tehran is succeeding in one key respect, bringing Israel closer to its Arab neighbors. The Warsaw Summit in February proved that Israel and the Arab countries can come together for regional collaboration. In their statements, Arab foreign ministers stood alongside Israel and against the regime that hijacked Iran and asserted our right to defend ourselves. Behind closed doors, even here in this building, many of the region's leaders freely admit that the main threat to the Middle East is Iran. Most of the violence, terror, and chaos engulfing the region leads back to one place, to Tehran. Our Arab neighbors understand that Israel is a leading force in the fight against radicalism and terrorism. And more and more Arab countries are forging new ties with Israel. These common challenges require Arab leaders to tell the public what they already know to be true. Israel can be a partner. We also see extremism within the Palestinian leadership. As Tehran openly calls for Israel's destruction, Ramallah uses other means to undermine the Jewish state's right to exist. This was best demonstrated just last week, when in response to a report on racism and discrimination within the PA, instead of acknowledging the facts, it wasn't us. It was a UN envoy. But what they did in the PA, instead of looking at the facts, what did the PA representative do? He quoted from an anti-Semitic and revoked UN resolution stating Zionism is racism. This despicable language exposes the Palestinian Authority's anti-Semitism as it continues to incite hatred among its people against Jews and the Jewish state. Both Tehran and Ramallah's extremism are increasingly at add with the growing sentiment among Arabs that Israel is and will continue to be a part of this region. Despite this situation, Israel remains interested in a dialogue through bilateral direct negotiations. So far, the Palestinian leadership refuses this path. Some of the challenges between Israel and the Palestinians are not only bilateral, they are regional, and regional problems require regional solutions. Therefore, I call on the regional actors 
who no longer see Israel as the enemy to be involved in finding a solution just as they were in the Bahrain summit. The Arab people must understand that Israel is not the problem. In fact, Israel is part of the solution. And we can be partners in creating a better future for the region. To that end, I want to address my next statement to the Arab people. I speak to you now directly. I say to Arabs throughout the region, what is known in Egypt and Jordan, Israel is not your enemy. Hey, to the Arab people around the region, what's already known in Egypt and Jordan, Israel is not your enemy. Normalization is in our mutual interest, and I want to emphasize that it does not come at the expense of promoting dialogue with the Palestinian people. We are ready to engage in direct negotiations. However, I must ask, will the Palestinians even come to the table? In his groundbreaking speech in the Israeli Knesset, our parliament, President Sadat said, and I quote, there are moments in the life of nations and peoples when it is incumbent on those known for their wisdom and clarity of vision to overlook the past with all its complexities and waning memories in a bold drive towards new horizons. President Sadat's words are not worse than today. Israel eagerly awaits when a Palestinian Sadat will emerge to join us in a bold drive towards the future. I thank you. I thank the representative of Israel for his statement. And now I give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you, Madam President. At the outset, and on behalf of the Arab group, we would like uh, to thank you for convening this important debate, and we would like to congratulate you on your presidency of the Security Council for this month. It also gives me great honor to deliver the following statement on behalf of the Arab group, except for Iraq, followed by a statement in our national capacity. Madam President, the Arab group decided to participate in this debate because the issues deliberated today strongly concern the Arab region. And we wanted to ensure that our positions on these issues, which threaten peace and stability in the region, are heard. Today, our region suffers from serious challenges posed by several existing crises and conflicts, the spread of extremism and terrorism, and uh, interference in the internal affairs of Arab states. It is unacceptable for the present situation, which has transformed the Arab region into an arena for international and regional confrontations, religious and sectarian conflicts, and a safe haven for terrorist organizations to continue. All these issues have led the Arab leaders to hold an emergency session in Mecca at the end of May 2019. Madam President, the declaration of the 30th annual Arab summit that was held in Tunis on the 31st of March 2019, this declaration underscored our commitment to addressing the region's security, economic and development issues in our mutual pursuit of protecting our communities and shared interests. In this context, Allow me, Madam, to underline five measures that the Arab leaders call to implement in the pursuit of achieving regional security and stability. First, intensifying efforts to end all forms of tension and conflict. We will continue our mutual efforts in accordance with a unified vision to strengthen Arab solidarity in securing and stabilizing Arab countries and improving their capacity to address political, security, economic, as well as cultural challenges. And this requires taking the lead to accelerate the efforts aiming at reaching comprehensive political settlements for the current crises. Here we stress that reaching a just and comprehensive settlement for the Palestinian crisis and the entire Arab-Israeli conflict is fundamental to achieving peace, security, and stability in the Middle East. 
This requires Israel's withdrawal from all the territories it has occupied since June 1967. It also requires the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital on the lines of the 4th June 1967. In addition, this requires putting an end to all forms of religious extremism exercised by Israel's occupying power in the holy sites in Al-Quds, including Al-Haram al-Sharif, and stopping its attempts to change the existing historical and legal status, which would increase tension in the region. In this direction, the Arab group affirms that the Palestinian cause remains central to collective Arab action. The Arab group is determined to continue efforts to relaunch serious and effective negotiations within a specific timeline so as to address final status issues, including the Palestinian refugees, in accordance with international law and the relevant UN resolutions. The Arab group will also continue to work on ending the crises and challenges facing Libya, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, and Somalia, as well as supporting reconstruction efforts in Iraq. In this context, we stress the importance of compliance with international law, the Charter of the United Nations, and the relevant Security Council resolutions because they are fundamental in achieving peace in the region. In this regard, the Arab group stresses the importance of upholding international resolutions relating to the occupied Syria and Golan. The group rejects any action aimed at changing the legal and demographic status of the Golan. Second, protecting the region from foreign interference uh, and ensuring that all states in the region respect the principles of good neighborliness uh, and refrain from the use of force and the threat of force and the violation of the sovereignty of states. In this context, uh, the Arab group reaffirms uh, its rejection and condemnation of targeting Saudi Arabia cities and territories with ballistic missiles. We also stress that the cooperation between Arab states uh, and the Islamic Republic of Iran must be based on the principles of good neighborliness, non-interference in internal affairs of states, and the non-use of force or threat to use force under international law, as well as refraining from uh, any practices or actions that undermine confidence building or threaten regional security and stability. Therefore, the Arab group condemns the Iranian government's policy and its ongoing intervention in its ongoing interference in Arab affairs, which fuel religious and sectarian, sectarian conflicts. And here we'd like to stress the need for Iran to refrain from supporting the groups that fuel these conflicts, especially in Arab Gulf states. We demand that Iran stop supporting and financing militias and armed groups in Arab states, and particularly to stop its interference in Yemen. We also demand that Iran stop supporting the anti-government militias in Yemen or supplying them with weapons, and to refrain from turning Yemen into a launching platform of missiles against the neighboring states of Yemen or threatening maritime navigation in the Strait of Bab al-Mandab and the Red Sea. These acts have had a negative impact on the security and stability of Yemen and the region in general, and is considered a clear violation of Security Council Resolution 2216. Third, Strengthening security coordination among Arab states and intensifying international efforts aimed at combating all forms of extremism and terrorism, including the eradication of their financial sources. The Arab group will continue to promote the values of tolerance, moderation, human rights, and counter any forms of sectarianism, exclusion, and marginalization, which are exploited by terrorist groups to disseminate their ideologies. Furthermore, we renew our support for the promotion of interfaith dialogue as a critical tool in spreading the values of tolerance, human solidarity, and acceptance of the other. Fourth, taking concrete measures to implement international resolutions relating to the establishment of a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. We also support the major conference that the United Nations will hold on this issue. The first session of this conference will be held this November, and will be chaired by the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Here we urge all concerned parties to participate in this conference in good faith to establish a stable security system that achieves the collective security of the states of the region with no discrimination. Fifth, 
focusing on achieving inclusive development to improve the social and economic situation of the region through intensified collective efforts aimed at enhancing and stimulating economic cooperation and by investing in the natural, financial, and human resources of the Arab countries. We also reaffirm the need to intensify efforts aimed at increasing the volume of trade exchange and launching investment projects which could contribute to forming an Arab economic bloc. Madam President, in conclusion, on behalf of the League of Arab State, uh, on behalf of the group, the Arab Group Statement, we stress that the League of Arab States, as an incubator of the joint Arab action, is best positioned to contribute to achieving the desired settlement and reconciliation for the crisis in the region. Therefore, we call on the Security Council and this esteemed organization to strengthen their consultations and meetings with the Arab group, especially when discussing Arab issues, in order to reach the appropriate solutions and settlements for the region's crises and conflicts. And here, the Arab group expresses its deep appreciation for the diligent efforts made by the United Nations Secretary General and his envoys to resolve these crises and promote stability in the region. Madam President, allow me now to speak in my national capacity, and I would like to mention some points that require a response so that we would clarify the facts pertaining to them, because we believe that it is important to do so in order to achieve the objectives of this meeting. Madam President, we regret what we heard today in terms of claims and allegations against my country on the developments that took place in Aden and Aden, and these are claims that we categorically reject part and parcel. It is worth noting that uh, my, my country has, and in an official statement, expressed its extreme concern over the armed confrontations uh, in Aden between uh, the legitimate Yemeni government and the Southern Transitional Council. And it has called for calm and non-escalation and for the preservation of uh, the security and safety of Yemeni citizens, which is the same position that it has adopted as a main partner in the coalition led by the sister the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Moreover, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and uh, as a member of the coalition, as a partner with the coalition, will exert uh, every effort to de-escalate matters in southern Yemen. It was a part of the joint team in cooperation with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia that sought uh, to conserve uh, the national institutions in Aden when, when the Southern Transitional Council was formed. And the team uh, sought uh, to coordinate uh, and uh, to achieve uh, calm between the different parties. And this is the role that is expected from states uh, that place the safety and security of the region as their major objective. And we flatly reject uh, the allegations that were made today. And we would like to make the reminder that the United Arab Emirates, and based on the official request from the legitimate government of Yemen, and as a member of the coalition to restore legitimacy in Yemen, which is led by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the UAE has taken decisive measures against uh, the uh, hostilities by the Houthis, uh, and in order to support to the legitimate government itself, and it has offered great sacrifices in that uh, objective, which would refute all the claims that, uh, unfortunately, were spread today in the context of disagreement and division, which the UAE does not consider itself party to. Moreover, we must not forget the important part that my country has played in the liberation of Aden and most of the countries that were occupied by the Houthi rebellion. And the UAE has, in turn, prevented the terrorist parties from taking advantage of the security vacuum during this critical and difficult phase of Yemen's um, life. And the UAE has managed to uh, play a great part uh, in reconstructing uh, the liberated areas, thus compensating in many instances for the weak performance uh, and the weak management and governance that the government has suffered from as, a, as as attested by observers. And my country here has uh, offered generous financial and technical support and has managed to neutralize the threat posed by Al-Qaeda in the Arab Arabian Peninsula and has also supported the efforts being made by the coalition in order to protect the freedom of navigation in the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb and the Red Sea. We did all this despite the fact that the legitimate government in Yemen was unable to manage its own affairs and was unable to perform properly. And despite the atmosphere of uh, rampant political and regional internal division that the government was unable to resolve uh, through constructive dialogue and through reaching out to all components of the Yemeni uh, scene. Here we would like to reiterate our calls that we have re 